Welcome to the final weekend of some world-class kite foiling here in Torre Grande, sunny Sardinia. Uh, we are about to bring you live racing of the Formula Kite Youth European Championship. And just because it's the Europeans uh, doesn't mean that we don't have uh, some of the rest of the best in the world. This is a very international lineup. Hi, my name's Andy Rice. I'm a sailing commenter, commentator from the UK. And with me is IKA president Mirko Babini and a native of Sardinia. So you must be very proud to have it here in Torre Grande. America. Yes, thank you, Andy. I'm, I'm living in Sardinia since many years. I'm not born in Sardinia, but I know this place since a long time. I can tell you Torre Grande has been in the radar from the national, uh, uh, for the national event, the international event from windsurfing on early 90s. So thanks to Heidi that bring up his passion and is continuing uh, organizing event and after windsurfing, he just started having kiteboarding as well, and what a great place to have this uh, this event here in Torre Grande. So there's Eddie Piana, owner of Yolo Risto Bar, um, our host for the week, and um, he's part of the reason why Torre Grande is such a, a popular place to go boarding. And it's, it's flat water, it's beautiful sailing conditions. Um, let's just take a look at the action from yesterday, from Friday. We've had three days of competition so far. Let's give you an idea of how things have gone so far. Julia Damasovic promised herself she could do better and on day four, the Polish rider delivered. With three wins from four races, Damasovic rises up to second place overall in the Youth European Championship and within striking distance of the event leader, Francis Heloise Pigorier. It was the first day of Gold Fleet competition for the boys, a chance to see who would come out on top in a head-to-head -head between the top two riders, Ricardo Pianozzi and Cuban Huang. The Italian won the first heat, but the Chinese rider won the next two, placing Huang first overall by a single point. We're into the final two days of competition this weekend. Right, so we don't have very long until the first race. I think we're coming into the the last couple of minutes before the start. There, there we have it. Two minutes to the start. And uh, Mirko, who have we got up uh, first? Because we got boys and girls today. Yeah, we start with the with the boys on Gold Fleet. It's going to be the first race of the day. It's going to be really interesting because we have Ricardo Pianosi and Kibin Juan continue their battle. Uh, over a meter uh, space between each other. So let's see how it goes today. It's going to be really interesting. I think we are really not far away from the start. A minute and 25 seconds. The wind uh, now is steady. Uh, we have like seven, eight knots looking from here. I think it's going to be... Uh, let's see. We don't understand if they will start... Uh, uh, all starboard or it's gonna be someone that we always really like to to see someone crossing the starting line on port is less than a minute handy yes uh, let's see if the port tax start is realistic it's a very high risk maneuver with all the lines the uh, the potential tangle of lines that you can get with high speed kite foiling remember these boards are capable of doing in excess of 25 knots going upwind and well in excess of 30 knots going downwind. So you really don't want to be uh, setting yourself up for a collision for any with anybody. 30 seconds to the start, and it's a matter of judging that time on distance as they come into the start line. And they're moving pretty quickly, Mirko. Yes, they are really close uh, to cross the starting line. We will see all the kite in, in a second just moving close to the water to get the speed and now now it is right so that is the start off and away and we will wait in here it's a clear start thank you very much grace committee 
and now you see on the left hand side some of the the Kites are already beginning to tack out onto port to sail out to the other side of the race course, out to the beach. Yeah. I guess that as, uh, as it is the first race, most of them, they will go a little bit further to the starboard side because, uh, you know, there is a little bit more wind. So they will take the benefit to have more pressure on the left side of the course and, uh, and then go to port close to the top mark. And on the right of your picture, Cuban Huang with a good start. Um, so he's the, the Chinese rider to watch out for. He's had an absolutely impeccable score so far. And he was the winner coming out of the first day of Gold Fleet racing as well. So he seems to be the one to beat here. Yes, it's really uh, difficult to see who is going to be the first one that's going to round the top mark. But for sure, we see Ricardo and Kibin and uh, Jacob uh, and Andrea Strajotti as well on the on the top of the fleet. So we need to wait for the rounding mark, Andy. Yeah, it's hard to say who's in charge at the moment, but it does look like Human Huang on the right of your picture is doing very well. And he's had a clean start and been able to tack on to Port exactly when he wanted to. And already he's uh, he's showing some pretty impressive speed. It's uh, uh, Lucas Fonseca from Brazil also up on that side of the course. But you look on the right-hand side coming in towards the beach, Ricardo Pianosi just tacking on to starboard looking pretty good on that side but it looks like the the boards coming from out to sea the ones that we see now are the most likely to be leading we just saw pianosi just going out of picture just then and cuban huang will be tacking fairly soon onto that ley line his final approach that's huang on the right of your picture just tacking now So it seems that uh, Kubin will be the first one rounding the mark, and Luca Fonseca and Andrea Strajotti. Uh, Ricardo got stuck on a little bit behind because he had to uh, to let someone from poor not clear. He was not on the perfect lay line. So Ricardo Pianosi with a lot to do in the pack here because the front three are clean around. And at the moment, the order is uh, Cuban Huang in the lead, Lucas Fonseca from Brazil in second, Andrea Stragiotti from Switzerland in third, Ulysse de Ripa in fourth. And then it gets really busy further back in the pack. Yes, exactly. Now a long reach all the way uh, to Mark two, and then it started the all the downwind legs. Um, Fonseca but, closing the gap on Cuban Huang. It looks like the Brazilian has a bit of a speed advantage at times on the Chinese rider. And then also looking on Ricardo Pianosi, it is spot in the eighth position. That means that tacking early on the, on the right side of the course didn't pay off at all. Yes, and we, we don't know whether he wanted to go that way or if he felt forced that way to find clear air. But you can see the front two, the Chinese and Brazilian riders have quite an edge on the, the third one. That's the red kite of uh, Stragiotti from Switzerland doing very well in these early stages. Yes, yeah, exactly. Amazing how Juan Quibin and Luca Fonseca, they are leading. They start jibing, both of them at the same time on port. And they're both pretty big individuals. Cuban Huang, someone showed a, an image of me, a video of me interviewing Cuban a year ago here in Torre Grande Beach and, and now me interviewing. And I can tell you, Mirko, I appear to have shrunk by at least 20 centimeters or, or maybe it's that Hugh Cuban has grown. He's, uh, what, 16 years old and he's, uh, he's very, very tall. Yeah, but you know, uh, when you are between 15 and 17, every single month count, and uh, you know they are also eating a lot. <laughs> they, they are, and when they eat, they go upwards. When when I eat, I go outwards. So Fonseca and 
uh, Cuban Huang really, really tight battle here. And Fonseca will take a lot of encouragement from this. He's on the... Well, he's the lower one of the two on your screen, and they do a simultaneous jibe. It looks like a better jibe by Cuban Huang. It looks like any advantage that Fonseca had, Cuban Huang has been able to overcome that with a superior jibe as they come down towards the bottom of the course. Yes, exactly. Uh, Cuban, he just passed him uh, during the jibe. He had a really faster jibe and with a better, a better angle. But now, let's see how it's going to play for the next leg upwind. A brief, really close, huh? Really close. I mean, Lucas Fonseca, he's absolutely on fire at the moment. Um, he came into the day in eighth place. He has been up in the top four for a, a lot of this week, but he didn't have such a good day yesterday. But the Brazilian will draw great confidence from this, the way that he's able to take the fight to Cuban Huang. But he's making life quite easy for Cuban in the sense that um, he's following, uh, and that makes it easy for Cuban Huang to cover. And actually, they go into a simultaneous tack. Meanwhile, on the far side with the red kite is Gian Andrea Stragiotti, who won here a year ago on the uh, the, the the A's youth kite, the, the the training wheels beginners version of foiling kiting. But Gian Andrea is clearly getting the master of the uh, the harder, faster, more refined equipment that they're using here in Formula Kite. Yes, I guess that uh, Juan Kibin and Luca Fonseca, they had a look on, on their behind, and then when they start, go to the right side, they simultaneously, like you said, tacking and go to the other side as well. But we can definitely see that Juan Kibin is way faster in upwind, uh, I mean, the difference on thermal speed compared to Luca Fonseca, which he, on the on the downwind leg, it, it passed him. So it was it was faster than Kibin, the Brazilian. So Cuban is taller than Lucas. Lucas has put on a lot of weight since last year as well. Um, so he's he's a pretty solid athlete these days. But Cuban is probably a little bit heavier. But also there's there's probably an element of technique involved here as well. Maybe there's a, a technique difference. Yeah, and then uh, we can see Ricardo now he jump on third already. So he passed from eight to third and is in front of Andrea Stragiotti, but let's see, there is a completely different tactics on the upwind legs. Yes, well, this time Pianosi has gone out to sea. He didn't do well coming from the shore side, so there's going to be interesting to see if Pianosi can attack uh, Gian Andrea Stragiotti for third, but it looks like Stragiotti, as long as he's tacked on a good ley line, should be able to hold on to third. And you can see in the middle of your screen, that's the red kite of Stragiotti, and he looks like he's some way ahead of Pianosi, who's coming across from right to left. And Pianosi should slot in in fourth place, just in front of the pack of kites coming in on the starboard ley line. That's Pianosi with his kite going in the sky and settling onto starboard tack. And at the Wimbledon mark, it's going to be Cuban Huang in the lead. And now it's a real close battle between Stragiotti and Fonseca for second and third. So this has been a good gain by the Swiss now on even terms with Brazil. It's going to make this life a little bit easier for the Chinese rider because this battle for second and third is really occupying Brazil and Switzerland at the moment. So Gian Andrea Stragiotti just on the previous leg, not afraid to try something different. Stragiotti has jibed away early. And now that's Fonseca. It looks like Stragiotti has found some a good breeze, good gust where he is. And look at the difference. Stragiotti on 30 knots. Fonseca not touching 30 knots yet. And Stragiotti on a completely different angle to the front too. So this is a really good attacking move by Stragiotti. And I don't think that was by accident. He jibed very early and he must have seen that gust and thought, I'm going to have a piece of that before anybody else. Yes, yes, exactly. I think they are keeping an eye on the on the patchy condition around the course. The wind, when it's seven, eight knots, you can definitely see where there is more pressure or not. And uh, he... he he picked up a good tactics on, on the downwind legs. So that's Stragiotti we're looking at now. 
with his red fly surfer kite. We do love red fly surfer kites. We'd love to see more of them on the race course. And the battle continues between the front three. It's Huang leading Stragiotti now into second and Fonseca in third. And quite a gap back to the next one, which is Ricardo Pianozzi. Will Pianozzi be able to close the gap? That's Pianozzi at the bottom of your screen now. So he's within striking distance, but uh, we haven't got a lot of runway left now, have we, Mirko? Not far to the finish. No, not far. This is the, the last mark before the finish. So this is how quick these races are, just a matter of minutes. And barring any last moment crashes, Cuban Huang is going to take another victory. And then it's going to be the battle between the next Stragiotti two. and Fonseca. I mean, now Stragiotti isn't second. He will keep, he will keep the second place. Yes. Great sailing by Gian Andrea Stragiotti to steal second place from Lucas Fonseca in third with Ricardo Pianozzi on four. in fourth. And that will be a little bit disappointing for Pianozzi, but it was all about his start and his first beat because Pianozzi really did come through very nicely later on. Yuli Starip in fifth, uh, Wojciechowski in sixth, uh, Wojtek Koska in seventh, third overall as things stand, uh, Mesquita in eighth, Yukovsky in um, ninth, and Mattia Maney from GBR intent so that's the situation back to you in a moment So Cuban Huang from China, the winner of that first race of the afternoon. He got a really nice start off the pin end of the line. And he's just got a little bit more pace going upwind than anybody else surrounded by the looks of it, Mirko. Yes, I mean, he, he didn't make any mistake. He had just a clear start and uh, he struggled a little bit to control uh, Fonseca at some point on the way downwind. But he, he keep focusing himself, no, no mistake, really good jibe on, over the last jibe to get the inside of the mark before the second bit upwind. And really good, really good move from him and he got another win. Uh, Lucas Fonseca, eighth going into today, um, was second for a, lo a lot of that race, finished third. He must be happy with that. And Gian Andrea Stragiotti from Switzerland, really good tactics, not afraid to do something different from the rest around him. Tacked off early up the last beat, jibed off at the windward mark. That was the winning move for him, hooking into that gust and going five knots quicker and 20 well, 10, 10 or 20 degrees lower than Fonseca. That got him into second place, didn't it? Yeah, it will help his, uh, his way to to get again on the top of the uh, with the result at the end of the day. So for Luca Fonseca, for sure, it's going to be a really big push for him. I mean, yesterday he scored two DNC over the last two races, so he really need to have a good result to keep improving and we will see him at the end of the day, hopefully, on the top. Well, in a moment, uh, we'll come back to you in a moment for the first girls race, uh, where we'll tell you how things are shaping up between the French and Polish riders. So back to you in a moment.
Right, so on to the start for the girls. We've got one minute 20 to go. And at the moment, in the lead, wearing the yellow bib, it's Eloise Begorio from France. And closely followed by her is uh, Julia Damasiewicz from Poland, who had a fantastic day yesterday, winning three out of the four races. And Julia was giving herself a, a big talking to two nights ago and said, come on, you've, you've got to do better than this. The, the French were dominating the top three. But Damasiewicz from Poland had a really good day yesterday and she's now got the bit between her teeth. I think this is one that she still believes that she can win. But can she overcome Pegorier today and take the yellow bib from her before they go into the medal series tomorrow? 35 seconds to go. Where do you want to start on this one, Mirko? I mean, I'm really... I'm. I think that it's going to be the same like the men. They will be all on starboard and uh, they are all approaching from starboard the starting line and we can see all line up just a few over the last 10 seconds we will see the same move the kite when the kite will start to go close to the sea that means it's a, just a big power before to cross and the that is the line. moment yes that is the moment so let's see if it was a clear start and we'll start to tell you who's coming where right now. Uh, we see uh, Damasovic coming out the middle of the line. Uh, she's doing very well in the early stages. Chloe Reville up on the right-hand side. That's closest to your screen. Um, and then doing very well also on the right of your picture, uh, Zoe Boutang from France with a really good start out of the pin end of the line. And you can see it's a very, very even start. There's, there's about eight or nine kites in a in a line for contention. No clear leader in the early stages. But uh, the, it's the likes of Zoe Boutang from France, Darren Atakan from Turkey. Eloise Pegorier is up there. Damasovic from Poland is up there. And Gal Boca, not, not a big rider from Israel, but right now Gal Boca also doing very well. Yes, yeah, a good thing that he continue to go way farther than the men on the starboard side, on the left side of the course. I guess that soon we will start to see uh, all of them tacking. And you can, can see Maria way on the back, but already tacked on, on port. Nina Arches, uh, strange to see her so way on the back. Yeah, I, th I think maybe not such a good start and, and had to tack out for clear air. Maybe that was the reason why. And now the front runners are beginning to all tack on to port. So we're going to see most of the fleet on port tack for fairly soon. And Heloise Pegorier, our yellow bib wearer, doing very well on the left of your picture at the moment. So Pegorier, can she do the same as Cuban Huang? Can we have two wins from the yellow bibs? Cuban Huang in the, the men, just confirming his yellow bib status with his first victory of the afternoon. Yes, I I think uh, Eloise Pegore and Nina Arches they will hit the the lay line on the right side of the course and, and reveal Chloe. Yes, Chloe reveal yeah. one of the first out to the right hand side, and the ones that tacked out early look like they've done okay. Actually, I don't know if they chose to go out there, but it looks like the right hand side has actually paid for, for some of the people that were further back. But that, that probably still won't be enough to get ahead of Eloise Pegorier, who has been able to sell exactly how she wants. That's Pegorier on your right of picture, leading that group of three on the right of the screen. But now we see the moment of truth because there is this potential collision course here between those riders. And that's... 20, I think that was 22 just tacking in ahead. I need to identify 22 if that's who I was seeing. But that's 22 fighting with Pegorier for the lead right now. So that might be Madalena Spanu from Italy. No, no, no. She's on okay. the back. She's not. So we think maybe it's a battle between Damasovic and Pegorier. These are the two front runners. Could yes. it be the yellow bib against the blue bib? Exactly. Because the blue bib is one, two, two, something like that. This is why you see the two, two. Right. 
number, but uh, I think looking from the drone uh, footage, you can see that the right end of the course might be okay for the angle and uh, might be better than the left side, but from the left side you have more pressure. So if you rely on the right side, then by the angle it's going to be okay, but maybe you are not get, getting enough pressure like on the left. So right. this is why the left it seems they are behind, but when they get closer to the top mark, then it gets better and they have more speed to round the top mark. This is good analysis. Uh, qu yeah, quite tactics. I'm and you can see there's more wind up by the shore that where the third, fourth, fifth and sixth are and the leaders are sailing out of the breeze as they sail towards the bottom of the course. Now, will this be an opportunity for Begorier on the right to be able to attack Damasovic on the left? This is yellow and blue bib in a really tight duel. And the way things are playing out between these two, you do wonder if it's going to be these two riders that book their tickets into tomorrow's medal series, the four rider final. Because if you can get through in the top two, that means that uh, you are guaranteed a spot in the four rider final. So there's a lot riding on it for Pegorier and Demasevich, as there is for everybody else, but looking really good for the front runners from France and Poland right now. And further back, we've got Lisa Caval from France. Uh, she started out the day in third. So we've got our top three in uh, overall, in the top three in this race right now, with Wojciechowska in fourth, Darren Atakan in fifth, Zoe Butang in sixth, Nina Arcic in seventh. Darren Atakan. Now, what is Darren Atakan finding here? Is this an opportunity for the Turkish rider to get through? She's on a completely different line. She seems to have her own personal gust. So that's yes. Darren Atakan at the top of your picture, way, way out in the distance. Let's. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is like we were saying on uh, on the upwind. Like there is a couple of patchy thing or around the course when you got to the long gust. You have to keep it as long as you can. So not the perfect angle, but she got uh, for a couple of seconds really higher speed compared to the other. And you can see how close it, she got to the to the one uh, to mark number three. Mm -hmm. So she will uh, take the risk now if she do the right jibe to jibe in front of Yulia and Eloise Pegori. Well, it looks like she's had to jibe just behind, but just Atakan behind, has yeah. put, oh, and, and it's not a good jibe by Atakan, so no. I think that was a touchdown by Atakan, but a really good gain by the Turkish rider, putting herself up into the top three if she can pull off yes. a decent lured mark rounding, putting her just ahead of Lisa Caval. So really, really tight rounding between third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. That's Atakan, Kaval, and Wojciechowska all going round together with a bit of a breathing space for the front two. It's still Damasovic leading Eloise Pegorier. But what a great spot by Darren Atakan. Decided to carry on rather than jibe like the front runners. Atakan sailing her own way down that run and finding an enormous gust to put her up into the top three. Yes, unfortunately, she didn't jibe well and she, she lost a couple of uh, spots because, you know, you lose five, six knots uh, in terms of speed during the during the jibe and then the other day, uh, yes. all coming and crossing you at more than 20 knots of speed, so easy to, to lose some space. Yeah. But, Really interesting to see now they all go to the uh, keep the left side of the course. Let's see if someone will take different tactics because uh, on this course the the upwind legs is not the same uh, over the second. So it's not after the starting line you go to mark one, then two, three, and then the upwind leg is further out. So the tactics might be different. And the, the angles look very different as well. Chloe Reveal on yeah. the left of our screen looks like she's in very different breeze yeah. and a lot lower than the uh, the riders like Pegorier and Demasovic. So it, the, the breeze is very variable across the course. And 
I, I think Reveal maybe suffered there, but the wind is swinging around from one side to the other. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work out that badly for Chloe Reveal. No, no, yeah, because they got a gas and they all of them, they just uh, attack on port and they are all, all of them now, they are going to go to the right side of the course and crossing the the ley line for Mark to again. And it, all in port. It looks really soft, the breeze right now. They're still firing along at, what, almost 20 knots. But they are capable of doing in excess of 20 knots. So the breeze is down, I think, isn't it? Uh, the, it's, it's shifty. Uh, I can tell you it's shifty. It's not maybe down because when you're running course between six to eight knots maximum, one knots make the difference. Uh, but it's super shifty because you can see all of them now close to the right side of the course, tacking and tacking again over the over the gas to get Mark II and round around Mark II as well. You can see how many how many tack we can see on the on the tracking system, Eloise and Lisa Caval and Magdalena tacking couple of time over the gas, try to rounding mark two again. So it was a kind of weird moment <laughs> close to the mark. Yes, but it, it looks like Damasovic and Pagoria have done enough despite all the randomness of the breeze to hold on to first and second place with Lisa Caval having to do a double tack to get up around the wind of mark, but Caval holding on to third place ahead of Wojciechowska, who's made a bit of a gain, of uh, Nina Arcic in fifth, and Darren Atakan, who, who was up in third at the bottom mark, is back in ninth place. I'm not sure what happened to her, but look at the speeds now, and the gap is still pretty small between Damasovic and Pigorie. Still the Polish rider holding a narrow advantage over the French rider as they come down towards the bottom of the course for the last time. Yes, but and now we can see the speed is a little bit lower compared to the first downwind leg is they are 26 27 now now they get the gas more than 26 so really interesting to see how far Julia can uh, can can stay in front from Eloise it's going to be a big battle until the finish line yes Pegoria with slightly better speed but Damasovic managing to withstand the pressure at the moment. She's inside, eh? she will be in the side of the mark, so it's gonna be really important to to jibe properly and and he have to do this jibe and another one before to get on the last leg. Yes, one more jibe to go after this one. Looks like there's more breeze on the far side and they're quite high with their angles, I think. They're in quite soft breeze at the moment. I don't think there's anyone close enough. But look at Chloe Reville, top right of picture. Completely different breeze and two or three knots faster on the far side. So there's going to be some place changing behind them. But I don't think there's going to be enough for them to attack the front too. It looks like the, the battle between Damasovic and Pigorier is going to continue to be that battle for first and second. And now Damasovic is just about to go around the final mark before the reach to the finish. And it's so close between these two. Damasovic cannot afford a mistake. She's got to get across this finish line because Pigorier is closing. And it's so cl close. Here we go. There's going to be... Whoa. Less than half a second in it, but that was just enough for Damasovic to close out the race win just before Pegorio overtook her. And then coming across in third is Magda Wojciechowska from Poland, just ahead of Lisa Caval in fourth. And then a bit of a gap back to Chloe Reville from France and Nina Arcic in uh, sixth place. So the, the front three, we, we see three duels between France versus Poland. And it, it's it's so incredible how, how it's so tight between the French and Polish teams. Darren Atakan coming across in seventh, ahead of um, uh, Darren Deniz, also from Turkey, and Mika Kafri in tenth. So there you have it. Three duels uh, between the French and the Polish, but the one that mattered the most, Damasovic, beats Pegorier and closes the gap on the yellow bib. Back to you shortly.
So, great finish there in the first girls race of the afternoon in the Formula Kite Youth European Championship here in Torre Grande, Sardinia. And uh, tomorrow is going to be the medal series. We're going to see the top 10 um, in the boys, top 10 in the girls go, go into battle um, and see who comes out on top for the podium. Um, at the moment in the girls, it's Eloise Pegorier from France that still holds a, a lead of a few points ahead of Yulia Demasovic. But it seems like Demasovic is the one with the momentum. Although in the, in the finish, Pegorier nearly managed to overtake Demasovic just in the final stages. It looks like for pure boat speed, perhaps Pegorier has the marginal advantage. We've got four minutes until the start of the next boys race. It was Cuban Huang who won the race earlier. Now let's see how things stand um, on the points after the race that we saw 10 or 15 minutes ago. So Huang extends his lead by another point. Uh, Ricardo Pianozzi was fourth in the last race. He holds on to second with 12 points. Gian Andrea Stragiotti with that amazing second place. Well, he moves up into fourth place, his highest position so far this week. Um, and it was a good race by Lucas Fonseca um, in third in that race. Um, still in eighth, which is where he started the day. But importantly, he's closing the points gap. And Fonseca could well move up the, uh, the order up into maybe the... Uh, the top five or six if he has another race like the one that we just saw. But Wojtek Koska, who we didn't talk much about in that race, he was seventh, uh, still holds a fairly comfortable third place in the standings. So anyway, we're going to see if anyone can hold a candle to Cuban Huang from China in the next race. That's just under three minutes from now. We will give you some analysis after this short break. R5, built to win. Now, two minutes to go to the start of the next boys race. Um, now, this is one of our uh, waterside cameras. We've got various camera angles. And of course, one of the recent innovations of the past few years is drones. And we get some of our best shots from the overhead drones. Bird's eye view, you could call it. Trouble is, Mirko, I was just hearing the... Arr, of seagulls. They're really not liking these drones. These drones drones that we buy from China are they don't seem to be welcome in Sardinia by the local Sardinian seagulls. Uh, it's not about the drone, it's about the seagull. The seagull here in Sardinia, they're really wild and they're attacking drone, no matter where they're coming from. Seagull, they're really attracted by drones. So when you have the drones, you need to really to take care of it. And it's easy to have the, the drone attacked by the seagull. But and they, are really, they are really big here, the seagull. Did you see on the, on the beach? I, I have seen them, and they are quite scary. But in a battle between a, a drone and a seagull, who's going to win? The seagull. Yeah. Definitely the seagull. Okay, well, there, there you have it. <laughs> um, so be careful when you bring your drone uh, to Sardinia. we got 50 seconds to the start of the next race, and this is going to be the boys. And remember, Cuban Huang from China won the race uh, 15 or 20 minutes ago. Here's the uh, approach into the line, and this is the time on distance judgment. 30 seconds to go. And it's so difficult to get this judgment right, Mirko. And it, what do you think people want to try this time? Win the pin or, or be able to tack off early? Uh, depends on the gas that they're going to have just a few seconds after the start. I guess that all of them, they're ready to, if they are clear ahead, uh, to tack and go to the right side. But really depends on the wind that they have just after the start. OK, well, let's see how it plays out. Three, two, one, go. Oh. Kites down into the power zone. Off they go. It's another clear start. Well done to the boys keeping it behind the line. And we'll start to see who's shaping up 
Gian Andrea Stragiotti with the red kite. He's had a good start out the middle of the line. Cuban Wang, he likes the right hand side. He sorry, he likes the left hand side of the race course from what we saw earlier and relies on his great upwind speed to be able to launch himself ahead of the pack on starboard and be able to tack where he wants. Yeah, all the way downwind, they saw the closer, the start closer to the pin. We saw Ricardo Pianosi and Luca Fonseca and Dan Bout and Jakub Jukowski. Um, so Pianosi with a much better start this time. Pianosi is managing to hold his lane out to the right hand side as you see it on the screen. Um, someone's had a bit of a, a splashdown and attack just then. Yeah, which it might be Kibin because we don't see him in our tracking system anymore. So it must be one of the two that we see struggling on, on the starting line, might be. Okay, well, let's see if we can get a visual spot on Cuban Huang at some point. But they're getting out to this ley line and the, they're beginning to tack on to port and it's looking very busy in this corner of the race course. Wojtek Koska doing well in these early stages. Lucas Fonseca from Brazil also up there yet again. Ricardo Pianosi doing well and Carl Maida. 15-year-old um, Carl Maida also doing well. The young brother. Actually, I think he might be 14. Uh, but anyway, Carl is getting serious about his his racing this year. There's a, there's a different look in his eye. And Carl Maida has gone from the uh, the kid that just wants to play on the beach to, to actually being a contender on the water. Carl Maida doing very well. Yes, they got really a good, a good spot on the right side. So Cuban Huang uh, is on the right-hand side of your screen. So Cuban Huang, we've managed to find him. That is him on the right of picture. And again, the Chinese rider looks like he's been in very good control as he goes into his final tack onto the ley line of this first leg of the race. Okay, so he's, uh, uh, Kibin is the one in front of Luca Fonseca. Okay, so this was the same one too that we saw early on in the previous race. Fonseca from Brazil, uh, who was able to, to attack Cuban Huang on the downwind. Brazilian seems to have very good speed on the downwind. And Wojciechowska straight behind and Ricardo Pianosi again in fourth. And Gian Andrea Stragiotti with the red kite in fifth. Exactly. Carl Maida, who I mentioned just now, he's up there in about sixth or seventh, so a good race for Maida so far. Here's the battle for the lead between Cuban Huang on the left and Lucas Fonseca from Brazil on the right. Doing about 32 knots of speed down when it looks like they've got a good breeze there right now, Mirko. Yeah, because we can see 33, 34 knots, 32. That means for sure that the wind increased a little bit and is less patchy than before. And now start the downward leg. And this is where there are some interesting choices and decisions to be made. This is where Gian Andrea Stragiotti um, was able to make such good gains. Th this is the um, this is the fleet just going round the second mark, and it's Cuban Huang out on the left of picture, still leading, and suggests that Ricardo Pianosi might have got up into second on the yeah. tracking. Let's see if that's how things look. Yeah, n now Pianosi, like Doreen before on on the girl, she might, he might, he might got a gust and different angle, and we saw it, the speed increasingly, increasingly, so he's definitely in a gust. So it's, it's about looking over your shoulder, if you can dare to look over your shoulder and, and see where the dark patch of water is and put yourself in front of that dark patch of water before anybody else. And Pianosi, has he really done enough to get up into the lead? He's going very fast down this run as the Italian and Pianosi could really do with starting to take some race wins off Cuban Huang to build his confidence going into the medal series tomorrow. Yes, for sure is is his aim in his head as well. Try to beat 
one key bean a couple of times today. <laughs> It's going to get busy down at this bottom mark. It's very, very tight between the front four or five or six riders. There's going to be traffic down here. So executing that final jibe and that final approach into this bottom of the course is going to be very, very difficult. Yeah, Kibini did an early jibe to put himself between, uh, I mean, on the inside side of the mark. Maybe he has to open a little bit the angle. And we understand that if he's going to open the angle, it's going to decrease his speed. So, Rika, oh, Ooh, but crash check. down. Yeah, just a butt check during the rounding mark. It looks like Wojtek Koska, I think maybe that's Koska tacking out early i think he possibly had the cleanest rounding of the front few so will Costco be able to get into the lead it looks like he can and and so this is uh, good news for the check rider who's lying in third at the moment they are all going to the right side straight ahead after the rounding mark they are all tacking to the right side of the course so for once cuban huang not in the lead. Cuban Huang not even in the top three at the moment. So we got the Italian Pianozzi leading. We got the Czech rider Wojtek Koska fighting for first place with Pianozzi. And, and Cuban Huang fighting with Lucas Fonseca for third slash fourth place. Yeah, they, are, they really need to play with the cast and the shift. The, the course are is super patchy and... It's really good to see how how they have to really pay attention on 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 get the right take the right choice. Very close between the front four riders from Italy, China, uh, Brazil, and the Czech Republic. Great racing going on between the front four at the moment. Yeah, I must say it's not only about get your uh, speed and your pace, but tacking more than once and tacking over a gas, which is not often, we don't see often on, on kite foil. Usually it's for go for speed, go for no mistake, go for the right tax on the right spot for a, for a ley line, but they are definitely doing tactics over the gas and do more tack than normal. And uh, now they try to stay on the on the lane line on starboard and we can see Ricardo Pianosi and Wojciechowska and Juan Kibin and uh, Luca Fonseca all shoulder to shoulder. Yes, very, very little in it right now. So uh, no one has managed to, to break out into the lead or into a clear lead yet. Pianosi with only a marginal advantage over Koska. And that's who we see fighting it out so close, locked together, doing about 22 knots of speed upwind. So Pianozzi and Koska right up there. And then beat away. We can see how they pump the foil to get more deepest angle and speed. Pianozzi is jibing, keeping straight ahead. So it's the battle between the yellow and the blue bib right now in the lead. And you can see that gust up there as the boards are going round the mark, the, the fifth, sixth and seventh boards. So there does seem to be good breeze up on that ley line. And it's interesting that Stragiotti with the red kite has chosen to jibe early. That's what did so well for the Swiss rider in the previous race. So Kibin is a little bit lower than, than Ricardo. They have almost the same speed, but it's lower angle. So this is an advantage for uh, Juan Kibin. Right, so this is a really, really important psychological moment for Pianozzi. Can he manage to beat Cuban Huang in this duel down to the bottom of the race course? Next time is gonna be, it's gonna be really important for both of them, I can tell you. Pianozzi on the left in the blue, Huang with that leaning back kind of stance and the yellow bib in the slightly more controlling 
move but actually yeah Huang goes up to windward and then goes into an early jibe and now it's the simultaneous jibe is there going to be a wrap oh, between the two of them no. and then fly surfer kites go into a tangle and this is the result of that duel and flying past them into the lead it will be brazil's lucas fonseca who goes right past them what an absolute disaster for the front two and what kind of mess and tangle have they ended up in yeah, it was the last jibe before to round the mark and go to the to the finish line. So, really, disaster. So, we have to see if they can extricate any kind of finished result out of this. Because it's, it's going to be Lucas Fonseca from Brazil, who is going to take the race win at the head of Wojta Koska from Czech Republic and Jan Andrea Stragiotti closing fast in third place. So, congratulations to the Brazilian, followed by Czech Republic, followed by Switzerland, and then it's a bit of a gap to the next few, and it's going to be uh, Nelda Jahan, the young rider, Wojciechowski. And Karl Mader. And Karl Mader. So well done to them, but what an absolute disaster. We'll bring you an update on that tangle in a moment. Well, what an exciting race that was, particularly for Lucas Fonseca from Brazil, winning his first race of the championship. Fonseca absolutely on fire. He was third in the first race, first in the next. That makes the Brazilian the most successful men's rider so far today out of our two races. But Mirko, talk us through that simultaneous jibe. What do you think went wrong? If you were going to say it was one person's fault or the other, can you identify who that was and why? No, I mean, we were just following. Uh, they are super close. We were just saying it's going to be the last jibe before rounding the last mark uh, and then go crossing the finish line. When Pianosi start to jibe, then Kibin just follow up straight to put himself a little bit uh, on the inside side uh, on the side of the mark and when we we saw the tips from keeping just being folded that means that during the jibe when he turned the kite just maybe touch uh, Ricardo's kite and and then the mess start and it was no way just bad luck that the kite get tangled all together not touch and sometimes happen that they touch each other and then bouncing back but in that was not the case really bad for both of them they're still swimming uh we can see from here the kite laying on the water not really good move for both of them so once your kite gets wet what effect does that have on your performance once you go sailing with that wet kite no for sure is the kite performing well when it's dry uh, the good thing is we are not a lot of humidity and it's warm enough, there is a good breeze, so as far as the kite fly, start flying on the air, get dry quite quick. Uh, but they don't have a lot of time, so let's see if they can get shorted out. First of all, all the line and nothing has been break in the bridal set. Yeah, and um, so what will their coaches, what will their support teams be doing? Will they be having another kite ready on the beach just in case? Yeah, but all of them, they have a spare kite on the beach. But again, uh, all of them, they really hope not the kite is not getting uh, damaged. So 2.20 until the start of the next girls fleet. We will have a quick break and we'll be back to you soon.
Meet the R1 V4, our highest performance Olympic and IKA registered racing machine. One minute and 20 to the start of the next girls race. Um, so th there's an interesting scenario here with what we've just seen with the boys. The yellow and the blue bibs, uh, Pianozzi in second, Huang in first in the overall standings. They've got quite quite a gap um, points-wise, so they can probably both afford uh, to miss a race and, and still be okay. Um, let's just have a look at the uh, the points with the girls. We've got 50 seconds to start. So uh, Demasovic, who won the last race just ahead of Pegorier, well, it's still a six-point gap, so there's still quite a lot of distance for Julia Demasovic to be able to close on Eloise Pegorier, and then a bit of a gap back to Lisa Caval in third, Chloe Reville in fourth, Magda Wojciechowska fifth, Nina Arcic in sixth, and then another gap to seventh place, Argentina's Catalina Turienzo. 24 seconds to the start, and well, we're st starting to see that there are opportunities on both sides of the race course. So let's see how things shape up in this next start. Just 10 seconds to go. Kites hovering in the sky in the next few seconds. Watch those kites swing down towards the water as the girls pull those kites into the power zone. And it's a clear start. And a really, really good start for Mika Caffrey, starting up by the committee boat, and a very good start for Lisa Caval, who's third overall at the moment. Lisa Caval doing very well on the right of your picture. She came off further towards the, the pin end, and Caval with good early advantage, along with Mika Caffrey. Really good, I must say, good spot for uh, Magdalena Wojciechowska, all the way upwind. Nice line, clear head. Yes, you're absolutely right, Mirko. Magda Wojciechowska started very close to the committee, but she's on the left of your picture right now, and she's in a good controlling position uh, because she's on starboard. Um, others around her are going to have to wait uh, before they can tack on to port tack, uh, which has to give way to starboard. So uh, tactically very good positioning by Magda Wojciechowska. And we'll be coming up to the tack fairly, fairly soon. And still very competitive in the front row. We've got Wojciechowska, Kafri, Atakan from Turkey, Heloise Begoria, our yellow bib wearer, she's up there. And Lisa Caval also doing very well. Um, Demasovic is a little bit second row. She's staying on starboard tack, but Demasovic is, is struggling to make her presence felt in the front row right now. Yeah, she started not bad, but not on the first row, so not a clear air, air on this kite, but she know that it would be been worse to tack to the other side, so she keep behind, not try to losing too much, too much space, and now she will uh, she will tack soon. And Demasovic and Pigorier and Caval are, are top three overall, are all on the far side of the course, on the right-hand side of your screen. That's where the top three in this championship are right now. And Demasovic has actually come out pretty well from her second row start. I think she's in a pretty good position relative to Pigorier. So that's a really close battle going on on that far side. But meanwhile, Magda Wojciechowska, who was able to tack when she wanted to, seems to be on a good high line on Port Tack. And, and this Polish rider, back in, I think, fourth or fifth overall, um, is looking pretty strong as well right now. So we can see Magdalena just tacking now because she's gonna be the first one that she will round the top mark. So Magda Wojciechowska, we spotted from the starting line. She was really in a great position, and she keep it. Absolutely. So tactically, beautifully position, uh, positioned, well-executed start by the committee boat, and a really good uh, spot of a lifting gust that has now put 
Magda Wojciechowska from Poland into an early lead ahead of Mika Caffrey, who's another name that we don't see up there so often, with Chloe Reville from France in third, Nina Archic in fourth, and a bit of a gap back to fifth place, Yulia Damasovic. But importantly for Damasovic, she's a few places ahead of Pegorio, who's back in about sixth or seventh place right now. Yeah, Mika Kafri, she's from Israel, uh, quite young, also from 2005. But as you said, it's the first time that we see her on almost leading, I mean, on the second, just straight behind Magda. Well, going into this race, Mika Kafri was in 11th place and at three points out of 10th spot. So if Mika Kafri manages to hold on to a, a good top three in this race, that could be enough to get the Israeli rider up into the top 10. And that's a critical number for tomorrow's medal series, where it's the top 10 are the only ones to progress through to the final. Exactly. Great chance for her now. So meanwhile, Magda Wojciechowska, she's actually stretched her legs on Mika Kafri, and it's Chloe Reville uh, who's fighting with the Israeli rider for second and third. It's a real close battle for second, third, and fourth, the other one being Nina Archic from Poland. And a bit of a gap back to Yulia Damasovic in fifth place, winner of the race earlier on this afternoon. And Eloise Pegori behind Yulia. Right, by how many places? Uh, one. Just, just one. Yeah. Okay. So that's the battle for overall honours going on in about fifth or sixth place right now. But bottom left of your screen, look at Magda Wojciechowska's stretching lead. This is really good news for the Polish rider. And she was fifth going into this race. Um, will this be enough to lift her up into fourth? Chloe Reville is currently in fourth, but uh, in the overall standings. But Chloe Reville is third in this race, so Reville should do enough to hold on to fourth overall as things stand at the moment. Mika Caffrey from Israel, she slipped to fourth in this race, but still ahead of Damasovic. And Nina Archic, who had such an amazing run in the medal series last year at the uh, the Youth World Championships, started the day in sixth and finished the day by taking the gold medal. So Nina Archish has happy memories of racing here in Torre Grande last year, and she's lying second bef behind her teammate from Poland, Wojciechowska. Wojciechowska's done her jive onto starboard. And just about to go round the bottom mark, with a clean lead over the next rider, Nina Archic, and Mika Caffrey, or Clo no, Chloe Reville in third. It, oh, that kite of Mika yes. Caffrey is a little bit collapsy as, as she goes round. That's not going to be a great rounding. I wonder if this is an opportunity for Yulia Damasovic to move up into fourth place. Much better rounding for Damasovic. Yes, because when you see the tip is getting folded, then you have to go downwind a little bit until it's open again and get the pressure, proper pressure on the kite. Otherwise, slight it's misjudgment. Be worst. Yeah, but the important thing that Mika Kafri has done, not only letting Yulia Damasovic go past her, so it's now the Polish rider up into fourth, but there's now one board between her and Pigorie, so that's a two-point gap now between Damasovic, who's looking to overtake Pigore in the overall standings. So will Mika Kafri continue to be that blocker between Damasovic and Pigore? Meanwhile, Magda Wojciechowska, bottom of your screen, still leading quite comfortably over another Polish rider, Nina Archic, with Francis Chloe Reville in third. Chloe Reville, a former 29er world champion. So she comes from a skiff background and has made a really successful switch and is part of the hugely strong French squad who have so much strength in depth in the girls and the boys and at senior level as well. Yeah, they, they show up in Torre Grande, quite a, quite a big team. Amazing. France is well represented here. As are the Polish. And we, we saw in the last girls' race, we saw the f top six were three Poles and three French, 
and it was three individual du duels between a, a French and a Polish rider. Very strange symmetry between the Poles and the French. And the, the girls actually had a tug of war on the beach yesterday as well. We were enjoying the battle on the water so much. We we thought we'd see who would come out on top in a battle of tug of war. But it, on, on that occasion, it was the French, who I think it's fair to say had quite a bit more weight in there for riders compared with the uh, the Polish girls, which included uh, Karolina Jankowska, who's uh, one of the youngest and also one of the smallest in the fleet. And Wojciechowska tacks on to starboard. Still ahead of Nina Arcic. Just floating her kite into the sky. And Yulia Demasovic now up into third. Yeah, it's going to be a battle at, at the end of the finish leg between the second and the fifth. Let's see. And Nina Harchis revealed Chloe, Julia Damas Damasovic, and Heloise. It's going to be quite a battle, isn't it? Third, yeah. fourth, and fifth going around this mark. It's going to be pretty straightforward for Wojciechowska going around the mark as we speak. Next up, Nina Arcic. Pretty clean second for the Polish rider. And then the next Polish rider, Julia Damasovic, just manages to get round in third place. So that's a very good upwind leg by Damasovic, now climbing up to third, getting ahead of Chloe Reville. So three Polish riders holding the top three spots right now. And one French. Straight behind. Eloise Pigorier possibly has got past her teammate, Chloe Reville. Pigorier wanting to keep that gap as narrow as possible between herself and Yulia Damasovic. And it looks like there's going to be another close battle between Pigorier and Damasovic coming down this final run. I wonder if they saw the tangle up between the yellow and the blue bibs in the men. Pianozzi and Cuban Huang. They won't want to get that close because that ended up in disaster for both of the front runners in the boys' division. It's going to be really interesting. They just spread out more than the men, you can see, and they are all on port. And Magda Wojciechowska, she's on the far side of the course, closer to... The, oh, that is actually Wojciechowska we're looking at. So yep. that's her and Archich with the, uh, the orangey-yellow ozone kite. Magda Wojciechowska going into what she hopes will be her final jibe and final approach towards the bottom of the course. But will she have been successfully attacked on the far side by Damasovic and Pigurier, who are coming down with good speed and good angle? There you see them coming into picture. Mm -hmm. And there's a possibility that Damasovic and Pigorie could Ooh. throw themselves into the mix here. Yes, because look at the cast over there. They have a different, completely different angle. And they might jibe just in front. This is critical for Damasovic. She has just got into the lead again. Just last gasp lead. Yes. Wojciechowska in second. And can Nina Arcic get ahead of Pigorie? It looks like Pigorie has got into third. So across the line, it's going to be Damasovic, Wojciechowska, Pigorie, and Arcic. So everything changed at the end. And Damasovic stole the race win off her teammate from Poland, Magda Wojciechowska. Yes, and uh, and she will know in uh, in her head that she know many point uh, she's behind. Uh, Eloise and then uh, scoring a bullet and then her fourth is a gain is a quite a good gain for her on the general it, result. It is so that th we'll be interesting to see how the points uh, stack up on the leaderboard later on. Chloe Reville in fifth, Lisa Caval in sixth, and Mika Caffrey from Israel in seventh. Back to you in a moment. <laughs>
So really fantastic finish to that girls' race just now. And well done to Yulia Damasovic, just stealing the win from Magda Wojciechowska at the end. Meanwhile, we've got about uh, five minutes to the start of the next boys' race, and uh, we want to find out if the two front runners, uh, Ricardo Pianozzi and Cuban Huang, have managed to disentangle their kites after that incredibly dr dramatic um, tangle up towards the bottom of their previous race. Now, this might need to be resolved by a protest. So how does the whole protesting situation work? Well, we've got a nice explainer from Austrian rider Valentin Bontus. So let's see what Valentin has to say about the world of protesting. Olympic classes that I've worked in, by far the most fun are the Formula Kites, and no one embodies this more than this guy, Valentin Bontus. Valentin, I, don't, I hope you don't mind me saying, but you come across as the class clown sometimes. Is that fair to say? That is absolutely fair to say. I'm, I'm happy to be making everybody laugh a little bit and, and kind of loosening everything up, because uh, sometimes it gets very stressful and very strict around here, and then it's good to have somebody making a joke here and there. And, but then when it comes to you know, being serious, I'm, I'm absolutely for it that you have to be on point with your performance. I can, I can see you getting more serious at times, but I also see that the whole fleet is getting more serious and, and incidents that people used to let go, a touching of lines or a touching of kites, is now becoming an offense that some people are protesting. Do you think that the kiteboarding world could, can hold on to its innocence now that it's gone Olympic? Well, I think, as you say, like touching lines and everything is, is a break of the rules. And I think we'll have to get into a stage where we have to separate the, the friendship kind of relationship to a professional racing relationship. Because at one point, if it's for an Olympic medal, let's say, I'm not going to just not protest you because you're my friend, right? We have to separate those two worlds for sure. Well, Valentin, um, I hope you manage to keep that smile on your face and everybody else's. I do see it getting more serious, but if people can fight on the water and still be friends, I'm sure that'd be a good thing, wouldn't it? Absolutely. I think, I think it's it's fair to say that everybody will be mature enough to to separate those two worlds, and and it's for sure going to be still a very good vibe around everybody and professional and uh, a proper way of, of living with everybody else. Cool. Thanks, Valentin. Thanks. Right, so uh, Valentin Bontis, one of the, 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 the jokers in the fleet, a uh, very entertaining guy and, and a lovely guy, also getting increasingly serious about his racing, making the point that the whole game is getting more serious. Uh, Mirko, uh, when you have a, a, a tangle up like you have between Wang and Pianozzi, it's, it's hard not to get cross with the other person. It's easy for, for you to think, I was in the right, the other person was in the wrong. Um, how, how do you think this is going to affect the relationship between Wang and Pianozzi when something like that happens? Uh, you know, when you are an athlete and you are competitive in any kind of sport, can happen. I mean, look in the motorsport. <laughs> Uh, is uh, almost every single Sunday or MotoGP or car racing or other sport as well that doesn't affect the relationship between the rider they are all competitive they know that can happen and uh, they, they will keep their mind focused on the race they, this is why they have coaches with ribs in the water help them have an overview that everything will work well for the next race and stay focused on the next one I think they don't even think about any single second about relationship. It's just about the performance over the next race. And then uh, when it's going to be end up the program for the day, then they will maybe fight each other for the protest. <laughs> so two minutes to go. Have you any idea um, how they are doing? Have they managed to extricate their kites from each other? Do we got any update on that? No, but uh, we can see on the, again, back, going back and forth on the tracking. So it seems that everything is uh, ready for them and they will uh, cross the starting line with all the other. So let's see, it's gonna and be interesting. We, we know that riders are obsessive about keeping their equipment or their kites dry, uh, if at all possible. Um, how much is 
having a, a wet kite going to affect their speed? Is it is it going to um, actually slow them down through the air? It it will if it's really wet. But again, uh, it was kind of five six minutes, maybe eight minutes on the hair. There is enough time to get it quite dry and not to have the performance badly, uh, so bad from the kite. So I guess that they they are comfortable. The problem if 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 you have a really wet kite, then uh, you know it fly lower, slower, and uh, doesn't respond to the your control bar bar quite quickly, like uh, when it's perfectly dry. So less than a thirty second to the start, Andy. Really curious to see. Yes, I am. And I'm, I'm sure the rest of the fleet will be curious to see if this is going to enable them to close the performance gap on the Ch Chinese and Italian riders. And I think that's Cuban Huang we see on the right of our picture. Um, and so he's back in and we hear that Pianozzi is also back in the race. So that's good news. Just over five seconds to go, and we're going to see these kites swing down into the power zone. Will it be another clear start? We'll find out shortly. And yes, it looks pretty good. Oof. Not clear. Oh, I've the commentator's curse. That start was not clear. One, one, two, uh, we're told, was over. We're just trying to identify who that is. Um, and if they go back to restart... Maybe Jonathan. Joseph was. Jonathan Weston from Thailand. Yeah. So will he be aware of that? And will he go back? Probably he won't. So, uh, yeah, Joseph might find that he doesn't get uh, a, a, a finish as he crosses so, the line. Pianosi and Juan Kibin, they are the two... The two oh, it's, uh, a, it's a U line, line. Sorry. Side. Yeah. There is no going back. Um, sorry. Uh, yes. Pianosi and Huang fighting on the right of your picture... So they actually started really, really well. Ulysse de Ripa from France also going well in these early stages. But uh, it looks like it's been a good recovery from that huge entanglement from 15 minutes or so ago. And Hubert Huang with a marginal advantage over Ricardo Pianosi. That's Pianosi furthest right on your screen as you see things. And second from the right, that was Cuban Huang. Yes, it's going to be interesting why Pianosi we see from the from the tracking and also from the last few seconds before the starting uh, crossing the starting line, Pianosi bear away and he want to clearly cut the spot the f as a first one close to the pin. So he decided to go on the left side of the course and then do these tactics. And really curious to see at the end. Well, it looks like Huang has the upper hand on Pianozzi at the moment, as they've both tacked on to port. So that's the yellow bib of Huang that you can see on the right of your screen, and Pianozzi just to the left of your screen. So at the moment, Pianozzi with the work to do to catch up. And just out of picture, where you can see them now in the center of your screen, the red kite, pretty much the only opposite color kite to everything else. Gian Andrea Stragiotti from Switzerland also going well in the middle of the course. There was a really strange tactic by all the fleet. Dif difficult to judge it from here, but really way to the left side and late tack. And it seems that they are getting uh, faster speed to be upwind. That means that the wind maybe shift a little bit. And now they are losing uh, uh, space because they were too high on the lane line. And they had to... to Beer away a little bit to be behind the red mark, the protector mark. Yeah. Yes. So there is a, that spacer mark where you see the, the rib in the middle of the course. The reason why it's there is to stop people tacking in on the port ley line. Um, so as Mirko just said, people have been overstanding that. But it is Cuban Huang who goes round in second, Ricardo Pianozzi. Uh, sorry, Kimi Huang in the lead, Ricardo Pianosi in second, uh, Gian Andreas Stragiotti in third, and Paul, Paul Labaudet in fourth. And Labaudet started the day in fourth, so this is a bit more what we expect from the French rider, but it looks like Huang has quite a healthy lead at the moment on Pianosi. So that tangle really has it looked on the face of it, Mirko. It doesn't look like it's hurt them that badly. Not badly, because that means that if they are in front, everything 
in terms of equipment works well, so no damage. Um, it's going to be interesting to see the battle until the end, because I'm sure that Ricardo Penosi will attack Kibin until the last meter. Right, well, let's see how he's going to do that. One thing that he might do is go into a jibe, and that's what he's decided to do. He so will, what... yeah. So Indeed. <laughs> early jibe and a possible gust that Pianozzi might hook into. And Huang takes a while to respond. So is that going to be a little late? Or does Huang like the breeze that he's got there anyway? We'll find out. But uh, we, we'll wait for Cuban Huang's speed to build up because Pianozzi is doing 31.3 knots downwind. And it looks like Huang is up to speed and has similar speed. So maybe it's not going to hurt him too badly. And so... It looks like Pianozzi might have closed the gap a little bit. Yeah, it looks like he is a little bit faster, a little bit lower. So so maybe that early jive is starting to pay off for Pianozzi. Yeah, and then you see all the rest of the fleet also, they went in an early jive just to get the gas from the left side, uh, their left side, I mean, right side of the course. And then maybe, you know, when you got more gas, more speed, then you are able to go deeper. And yes. this is what they are looking for. So are they going to get anywhere close to each other at the bottom of the course? Because, of course, it will be going through both of their minds what happened the last time these two met at the bottom of the course. But it looks like Huben Huang still has enough distance to stay ahead of Pianozzi. So they're both safely onto their final jibe before they go around the bottom mark. And then back in third, it's Stragiotti with the red kite. And he looks like he's going to have a little bit of a battle on his hands. Cuban Huang coming down to the bottom of the course, still managing to hold the lead. But Pianozzi possibly has closed the gap a little bit. And there's less than a second between them. It was a no nice mar rounding for both of them. Pianozzi a little bit, let's say, straight uh, right angle, closer angle. And uh, just to avoid to have the kite feeling the air from uh, from Kibin, and obviously Kibin will respond to a, an early attack on the right side because you have to cover him and follow him. Exactly right, Mirko. So uh, Cuban Huang not letting Pianozzi off the hook. He's going to shadow his his moves and whatever the Italian wants to do. The Chinese rider is going to try and mirror it. So whilst those two are paying attention to each other, is that an opportunity for someone like Gian Andrea Stragiotti with the red kite to be able to move up the order? So they surely can't already be on their ley line. So this is a match race developing. They are doing extra tax more than they need to. So that's going to give away valuable distance to the riders behind. So this is starting to get personal, Mirko. Yeah, no, exactly. And also, I guess that Ricardo just figure out that there is no way I go for speed and I can shadow just what Kibin is doing. He need to find out something different. So he's playing with tactics and doing tacks over the gas and try to close the gap with different angle and do more maneuver. I mean, he rely on himself doing the maneuver. So this is all playing into the hands of Gian Andrea Stragiotti. He'll be enjoying the facts that the uh, the two yellow fly surfer kites in front of him are doing more tax than they would normally lead to. Will it be enough for the Swiss rider to start threatening the front two? We'll have to wait and see. That's Stragiotti just floating his red kite up into attack right now. But still, it's Cuban Huang who leads ahead of Ricardo Pianozzi in this battle. That's the battle between first and second. China on the left, Italy on the right. And if anything, it looks like they've stretched their lead. They've done extra tax. And maybe those extra tax have actually taken them to a more favorable side of the course. Yeah, but again, Kibin is leading and Ricardo just straight behind this. Just try to force him in more maneuvering and force him in a possible mistake. But the Chinese, the Chinese boy is... He's too good. He's really good, yeah. But it's worth a go, isn't it? It's worth, it's worth trying to make life more difficult for Huang. And so good on Pianozzi for at least giving it a go and trying to mix things up.
But going around the top mark for the final time, it's still Cuban Huang, who, if anything, has stretched his lead compared with the bottom of the course. Piano's going for the attack, going for the early jibe again, and it looks like he's got the gust to do it again. So surely Wang will respond with a jibe fairly soon. Stragiotti with the red kite going around in third place. Pianozzi looking fast down the far side of the race course. Now Wang goes into the jibe. Yes, strange that it took quite a while for Kibin to go on, on port. Uh, he let Ricardo go, I mean, to spread out too much. I would not... Myself, I would not accept that, but let's see, maybe Kibin, he, he, he sees something else and he was just following uh, the cast and... It's quite surprising, right. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. There, there goes Pianozzi into the jibe top right of your screen. So we assume that he thinks that he's on the final ley line to the bottom mark before they turn to the finish. But it looks like... It looks like Stragiotti might even be in front of Pianozzi. It looks like that gamble of, of attacking is not working out for Pianozzi. And, and now, well, Pianozzi's still in front of Stragiotti, but look how much distance yeah. he's given away. But I, I can't blame Pianozzi for doing that. You might as well roll the dice and, and try something different. But what surprises me is, is how much he's lost. Yes, uh, as I was telling you... Uh... He went in an early jibe, uh, Kibini should shadow him and stay more closer. He was really convinced to go on that side and keep the starboard, the starboard part longer because if he said, okay, it's a real gamble, uh, it's not going to work, and he was right. It's, it's right to do yeah. that, and as long as he doesn't lose a spot to and, uh, Stragiotti, that's fine. But it's the race win to Cuban Huang, yet another race win, bouncing back from the entanglement with the perfect answer. And it's Ricardo Pianozzi who comes across in second, and then in third place, the ever-improving Gian Andrea Stragiotti coming across in third, followed by Wojta Koska, and Jakub Jokowski and then Yuli Steripa and Paul Labodere are the next two, followed by, well, Jonathan Joseph from Thailand, but we think that's the, the board that was disqualified from being over the line too soon, folks. So, unfortunately, for Jonathan Joseph, Penn Weston from Thailand, that's probably going to be a score that was good, but won't count for anything. Okay, another interesting race done and dusted. Back to you soon. So we've got just under five minutes until the start of the next girls' race. And just to remind you that right at the end in the previous race, Yulia Domasevich just managed to beat uh, Magda Wojciechowska. Uh, so there are the standings now. You can see that uh, with that race win and Eloise Pogore finishing third, that the gap continues to close between the front two. So Domasevich is doing everything she can to try and take that yellow bib away from Eloise Pigore, but it's not quite enough yet. But look at the points gap back to third. Lisa Caval, the best of the rest in third. Chloe Reville in fourth. Magda Wojciechowska, second in that last race, nearly won that race. If she'd have won, she'd be up to fourth. But she stays in fifth with Nina Arcic from Poland in sixth place. So uh, we've got, I'm just trying to find out how long we've got until the next start. I think it's probably about four minutes to the next start. 
three minutes 30 is what we have okay um so what do you think uh do you think julia demasovic has the ability today to close the gap mirko four points is that possible in the louise pigurier well, i mean we have another two to three races to go uh to close the day and if she's gonna get um the top spot or the second for sure she's gonna be in the final uh well she, she, she she's she's looking good for that because the front two have such a gap um she's she's very likely to to book her spot but she'd really love to get that yellow bib because that would be one more match point she could take in to the final which we'll we'll explain the mechanics of that a little bit later on um we'll take a, a quick break and then we'll build you up to the start of this next race One minute 45 to the start of the next girls race and the breeze is holding up nicely. Uh, Mirko, we don't need a lot of breeze for these foiling kite borders, do we? I mean, they're, they're so efficient in even not very much breeze. No, you know, when you have five knots, you can, you can fly and... What kind of speed can you do in five knots of wind speed? 20 on upwind and 20 plus on the downwind and uh, when you have six knot you can have a fair racing uh, now we have maybe six to eight and you can see everyone is just full on 23 24 upwind and plus 30 30 32 knots on on the downwind so efficient not only by the hydrofoil um, Above the board, but below the board, but the kite is really efficient, and with this shorter line, uh, tiny bridle is super, is super good, and they keep the the trimming really well. I mean, uh, we we saw it over the last two years how the performance went better and better and better. Um, we've got 30 seconds to the start of the next race, and there you can see the fleet. Lining up and 20 seconds. Looks like they're quite far back at the moment. And the breeze is really beginning to swirl in our studio. I don't know what it's like for them in the final five seconds going into the start. Two, one, off they go. Clear start, okay. So that's good news for the whole fleet. We're into a clear start and good early showing from Eloise Pigorier near the committee boat. She's had a good start on the right-hand side. So uh, Eloise and uh, Julia, and they are all close to the starting boat, to the race committee boat on the right side. Why do you think that they've chosen the committee boat end? Because it's not been that popular so far this today. No, that's, it's really interesting because you see the first and the second from the men, they were all the way to the pin. And uh, now the girl, they decided just to start, uh, I mean, the, the leader all the way to the right, close to the race committee, so the boat. So I don't think they're gonna, uh, they change it, the, the starting line, uh, we don't know. Uh, Maybe it's just the wind that sometimes is better on the right, sometimes is better on the left. Still patchy, so let's see at the end. But anyway, Eloise, she really did a really great start on the right side, getting the gas by first, good pace, good angle, and uh, Julia just just straight behind. They will tack soon because now the wind switch little bit the direction went a little bit to the left so 
they will tack soon on the right side of the course. And what about the other boards that started further over to the left? Uh, how, how are they doing and who, who are we looking at over there? Uh, there is Durin, uh, Atakan and Reville Chloe. Uh, let's see, they just have to tack now because they hit, just hit the ley line on the left side. I guess that it's gonna it's gonna happen like in the men that we saw. They have to bear away a little bit and to get more speed because they just went too much up. You can see the angle on on our tracking system. You can see the the difference between Nina Archis and Eloise Pegore compared to Reveal and and the other all the way upwind. So you can see Eloise yeah. Pegore in middle of the fleet looking pretty good. But uh, uh, Mirko, what do you want to say? Because the, the, the directions are changing quite a bit on the trace. Looks like there's a bit of a right hand shift as they get closer to the beach. Yes, exactly. I, it seems like the men, they also did it wrong. They spotted wrongly the, the, the top mark and uh, maybe they tuck looking the yellow uh, instead of the red, which is our protector mark. And so the ley line is a little bit shorter on the left side of the course compared to the right. And, uh, and also it's closer to the shore. So the wind might switch a little bit more and uh, not always at the same time. It looks but very close between the front few right now. And Lisa Caval, Doreen again, it seems that she, she got the right spot. Let's see if, if, if she's gonna be able to round the mark on the top. It looks like Darin Atakan has yeah. got round in first place just ahead of Lisa Caval and Eloise Pigorier. So really close with Turkey holding a marginal advantage over the French riders. But will the less experienced Atakan be able to keep back Caval and Pigorier, two of the strongest riders in this really, really powerful French squad? And it's quite a gap. Back to the next, it's another French rider, Chloe Reville, leading the next of the pack. And Julia Damasovic is in about fifth place at the moment. So we saw Damasovic come up beautifully through the fleet in the previous race. It's quite a gap to close this time, but will the Polish rider be able to close in on the front three again? Yeah, it's going to be really interesting now after the reaching all the way from Mark 1 to 2 and look on the tactics over the, the downwind legs. Uh, let's see what they're gonna, what they're gonna do if they're gonna go on the, on the jibe, on an early jibe, or try to follow the wind on the right side. Pigore in third place is holding a good low line, which is giving her good tactical advantage. It's making it very difficult for Caval in second to decide when she can jibe. Darren Atakan furthest right on the picture, still leading, so still in a good controlling position. And the front three continue to maintain a, a clear uh, meterage between them and the rest of the fleet. And remember, it's Yulia Damasovic uh, who is in the chasing pack with Wojciechowska just behind. So Atakan goes into a jibe. Yeah, not a nice one, I must say. <laughs> So maybe this is the moment the Turkish rider loses the lead. We'll have to wait and see. Or maybe that was... Eloise did the, the perfect jibe, and then now she's leading in front of Dorina Takan and Wojciechowska and Lisa Caval. Magdalena, she did uh, an early jibe, a little bit upwind, tried to get more deep, say deeper, uh, lower angle deeper angle so but it's gonna be really interesting now we saw everyone also in the previous race when they have to do the last jibe on the right side if the angle is gonna be perfect for the mark or not Eloise it seems she got the lead it looks like she has and now we see the kites float into that jibe at the bottom of the course before they go round the lured mark and it's Pigoria who now takes the lead. So it's the yellow bib that takes the lead. Will this be her first win of the afternoon? Round in second, it's Darren Atakan 
from Turkey, our early leader, and Lisa Caval in third, and still a slight gap, but not such a big gap, back to Yulia Damasovic in fourth. So this is important for P Pigorio to re-establish some momentum in her favor because things were starting to go all in the direction of Yulia Damasovic. But Damasovic struggling in this race, well, by her high standards anyway, um, she is still in fourth. That's not at all bad. And there is still another lap to go for Damasovic to see if she can go on the attack and get into the front three. At the moment, the front three are Pigorier, Atikan, and Caval. France, Turkey, France. Go for attack. Pigorier has tacked. And Lisa Caval and Doreen, a little bit further out, close to Lisa. It seems once they're in clear air, they do like this left-hand side of the course. Maybe there is just better breeze on this side of the course, generally. It's not it's not clear-cut. There are other options, but they do seem to be protecting the left-hand side. Yeah, it's going to be interesting now between Lisa Caval and Turin Atakan, the Turkish. And Eloise now, it's going to be really important for her to, to win one race after having Yulia all the <laughs> over the last few races on in front of her. And that's that's Yulia at the very top of the screen. She's the furthest up and I'm quite surprised where she's positioned herself because she's run out of tactical options up there so it had better work. But at the moment, it doesn't look like it is. And I... Four, four to fifth, yeah. Oh, well, if, well, maybe it's not so bad. It, it, I worry that uh, she's put herself too much into one corner there, but we'll see how things play out. Pigorier with another good tack, looking very solid, and she's on her final approach to the top of the course for the last time in this race. And she's got a bit more of an advantage distance-wise over the rest of the fleet, so... Pigorio looking quite comfortable in the lead with, well, am I going to have to eat my words? Is this Demasovic who's come up, managed to come up into second place? I think she read that upwind leg better than I did. So because she went for a really an early tack and she get more angle, uh, a better angle to the to the top mark. So she she come from the bottom from from below then all the way to the to the top mark. Well, very impressive tactical Whoa. call by Damasovic. Wojciechowska in third, Lisa Caval in fourth, Derin Atakan in fifth. So things are really mixed up on that previous windward leg. Yeah, you can see from oh, this. Hang on, what uh, happened there? No. Someone. Someone. Is that Damasovic has just, I think Damasovic has had a crash. I don't know if she yeah. hit some weed or yes. something, but that has not gone well for Damasovic. It was, was Julia, yes. Look. So maybe she hit some debris or something like that. It, probably the most likely answer. So unfortunately, Damasovic no, after... It, it was a kite. Oh, she ran over a kite? Okay. I, I, can't, I can't see. It was, it was weird, the image. We can't really... See, it. maybe we will see again later. So this is making life much more straightforward for Eloise Pagorier, who looks like she's set to run away with race 14 and put her first win on the board for this Super Saturday. Yeah, it was somebody else that uh, on the car because Magdalena back second and then Lisa Caval and Derina Takan on four. Well, that's oh, really unfortunate for Yulia Damasovic because she was on a charge today. But this is one race she's not going to win this afternoon. So we hope she gets back up and running for race 15. Pigorio completes her final jibe of race 14, about to round the lure mark and the high-speed reach into the finish. And she's got absolute night and day 
between her and the rest of the fleet. She's really stretched her legs after the Damasovic crash on that final downwind leg. So congratulations to our yellow bib leader, Eloise Pegorier, winning race 14 at a canter. And now it's a much tighter battle coming into the finish for second and third. Will Magdalena Wojciechowska manage to just hold off Lisa Caval? It looks like Wojciechowska takes another second place ahead of Francis Caval in third. And then it's Chloe Reville from France fighting. To, yeah, Darren Asakan in fifth. I think Reville takes that. And then it's Nida Arcic with the orange ozone kite coming across in six. And then Argentina's Catalina Turienzo in seventh so another dramatic race and unfortunately the the drama fell to Yulia Damasovic having that crash when she was lying in second place back to you shortly R5, built to win. To Eloise Pegore winning that race and commiserations, commiserations to Yulia Damasovic, who fell while lying in second. Uh, now, we've got an absolute legend of the sport, Alessandro Sensini, who has been uh, present in Toro Grande this week. I'm sure it's someone you know very well, Mirko, from your windsurfing days. Uh, let's find out more about Alessandra Sensini and why she's been here in Toro Grande. With four Olympic medals in her glittering career, Alessandra Sensini is one of the all-time greats in Olympic sailing, achieving those four medals in windsurfing. Alessandra, we're seeing even more board sports in Olympic sailing now. What's your role with the Italian Federation? I am the director of the youth sailing department and um, that's why I'm here with the kids uh, to help them uh, in these important competitions. We start uh, with the kiteboarding, uh, with the 20 racing uh, in 2018 when, with the Youth Olympic Games in, in Buenos Aires. And then they switch to foiling, to kite foiling. Now kite is uh, at the Olympics, uh, Paris. Uh, 2024 so that's a, a great uh, opportunity for all these kids to go to the Olympics in this beautiful uh, discipline. Um, and we see that some of these kids are actually sailing Olympic standard it's quite possible that we'll see teenagers win Olympic medals in Paris 2024 so does that require a, a different kind of coaching when athletes are so young? I think that the foiling uh, put down the age of the athletes and I think this is great and um, yeah I think uh, I'm sure that we will see in Paris uh, uh, athletes that will have the medal that they are really young and uh, they have uh, better skills uh, on this discipline and uh, uh, they are really strong and I think it's a good uh, thing for the for the sports when uh, you to have opportunity to beat the older. <laughs> so you competed at six Olympic Games. You won four Olympic medals. So in those other two, presumably you were disappointed not to win medals. But but what do you learn on on the journey of competing on a campaign with the, the highs and the lows? Well, you learn a lot from when you lose, of course, because it's there that you learn <laughs> really what to do. And uh, but in a way, in, in some way, it's even easier because when you lose, you have other people to watch to, and uh, you um, you have a, a better idea what uh, to do. It's when you are on the top, when you win, that you have to invent yourself, and this is not uh, so so easy so and um, but um, uh, what I say it's a, a competition it's always a challenge and uh, what you learn is uh, uh, 
to challenge yourself every day. Every day you go in the water, you have something that you have a goal and you want to get it. And uh, he, he, yeah, you, you, your life is dedicated to that sport and uh, to that dream that you have that is the Olympic. Even though you're in a solo competition, a, a solo windsurfer, a solo kiteboarder, you need to have a good team around you? Uh, yeah, but um, you have to be. You have to think that uh, um, you um, need to succeed with what you have. You know, first of all, you have to look at what you have at the moment, and uh, and say, okay, I have this. I want to reach this uh, uh, goal, this uh, result, and. Um, and then you you have to do it with what you have. You have to uh, get uh, the the best or the I mean the the most, not the best, the most of what you have, and not think too much uh, about what what will be the best uh, team or organizational program uh, uh, to you know to succeed. You need to start from what yeah you have at the moment, and then after. Uh, you reach uh, something and then you start to build again. Okay, so uh, that process of, of working with what you have but always looking for the next step. Alessandra, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Mirko Bobini, if Alessandra Sensini was young enough to be Kite foiling, how, how do you think she would have gone? She was obviously amazing at windsurfing with four Olympic medals. I mean, Alessandra, also for windsurfing, uh, she was just so focused, so committed to be in front. She had to have someone in front, so it doesn't matter. It wasn't windsurfing. If it would have been now in the water, dealing with all the, the girl, she would try to do as, as best. <laughs> and as much as she can to, to be in the front, I'm pretty sure that she would go for a win and get a medal for the kite as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> pretty sure. Well, the, the sport is coming on so quickly. The speed of these boards is, is so far beyond anything that we've seen before in, in Olympic competition. Okay, the, um, the NACRA 17 catamarans are pretty quick, and now we've got the IQ, IQ foil windsurfers as well, but the speeds are, are just immense, and the, you need a lot of physical courage now to sail these boards at these speeds, because the Me crashes can hurt, can't they? M mental as well. Yeah. Definitely mental, physical, but mental as well, because when you start to go faster than 35 knots, you have to get used uh, to go the so fast in the water and and between the other doing race and just not by yourself well this is gold fleet race seven for the boys just about to get going in 20 seconds from now we've seen the recovery of cuban huang and ricardo pianosi having that entanglement two races ago let's see who comes out on top this time final 10 seconds into the start we're on a u flag which means you cannot afford to be over there's no going back Three, two, one. Let's see how it works out. Clear start. Great. And coming off the uh, committee boat end of the line, it was uh, Jonas, Jonathan Joseph from Thailand. And then who do you see down at the pin end? Yeah, Kibin was one of the the first, uh, let's say the second or the third on close to the pin on starboard and just release the Reaper, I don't see Riccardo Pianosi. Someone's had a bad crash on the left-hand side. We don't know who that is. We'll see if we can identify them in a moment. But yeah, let's see if we can find where Riccardo Pianosi. It, right, so it's Riccardo Pianosi, the second from the right on our screen. You can just about make out the blue bib as there's another crash on the left. Yeah, exactly. Just behind the... Uh, okay, now now we have Riccardo just appear on the tracking. Yeah. He's so just straight behind Kibin. Okay. What a surprise. Uh, <laughs> so successful tax on to Port, and we, we see another battle between 
the leading Chinese and leading Italian riders. That's the two of them that we're looking at. Absolutely charging along bottom left of your screen right now. Already extending the gap on the rest of the fleet. But Ulis the Reaper is not so far. He has a quite a good pace on on the upwind. So that's Ulis de Reaper on the far right of your screen. The best of the rest on on the right hand side, and it's Cuban Huang on the left and down to leeward, Ricardo Pianozzi. So Huang keeping a close eye on Pianozzi, and it looks like it's the Chinese rider that yet again has the marginal advantage in these early stages. Surprisingly, um, I don't see Stragiotti. Uh, okay, nine, eight or nine. Not in the front for this time. We can see the red kite. I mean, that's easy to spot him. Gian Andrea Stragiotti with the red kite, um, middle right of the screen with that bunch of five kites, but up in front already with quite a good lead, except for, as you said, Mirko, Ulis de Ripa. It could be that de Ripa gets in between Pianozzi and Huang, depending on how well he executes his tack. Oof. Well, what did you think, Mirko? Not the best tack? Uh, no, was he, he tried to do it as really quick, really aggressive. I think he keep just a couple of meters behind Pianozzi. So that... You see? Yeah. So, uh, let's see, we've got... Kibin, Pianosi and the Reaper. the Reaper. And quite a gap, even a gap between first and second now. Quang leading Pianosi quite comfortably and Ulis de Reaper in third. Lucas Fonseca from Brazil in fourth. Francisco Pero in fifth. Jakub Jokowski in sixth. So we've got some new names up in the top ten as well. But not the front two. We've seen plenty of Huang and plenty of Pianozzi today. But again, Juan Kibin is leading and Pianozzi is trying to catch him. Deja vu. It, oh, it, oh, you can say. It, it is. Unfortunately for any Italian fans like yourself, Mirko, yeah. you, you want to see Italy starting to beat China in these races, but it... It looks increasingly like <coughs> Kibin Huang is going to be hanging on to the yellow jersey going into the final day, which is a significant advantage going into the final medal series, more of which we'll explain a little bit later on. And then you saw uh, that there is uh, Paula Bourdier, Francisco Peiro, Jan Koskowski, which is the first time that we can see so... So, in front of the fleet, and they're also good speed. So they had, right. for sure, they are increasing their their skill during the start. And you know, when you start to have a clear start, it makes the difference. And they're learning so much with each start. The ability to line up against a world-class fleet the way that they are. And another parallel competition that we're not covering on the live stream, but the Masters Worlds is going on here as well. And we, we've got um, age 35 and over competitors. And the oldest that I'm aware of, I think, is 59-year-old uh, Charlie Bingham. But I might be, might be that there's one or two even older than that. But Charlie Bingham from the USA only took up kite foiling a couple of years ago. And what a skill to develop in your late 50s. Kimin Huang round the lower mark, still in the lead. Ricardo Pianozzi in second. Ulis de Ripa from France in third. And very, very big traffic coming in after that. So the front four, they have quite a lead on the rest. Paul Labaudet in fourth. And then Spain's Francisco Pero in fifth. Jakub Jokowski, Dan Bout, um, and uh, Jonathan from Jonathan Joseph from Thailand in seventh. Very busy back in the fleet. Huang continuing to lead out to the left-hand side of the course as he sees it. That's bottom right of the picture as we see it. Yes, now it seems also the wind increased a couple of knots because we say we can start also to see from here some white caps. Great. Um, 
so it might be closer to 10. I mean, should be 10. Does that mean it, they should be changing kite size, do you uh, think? Until 10, 12 knots, they, they will keep their biggest kite anyway. And we've seen a gradual move to fly surfer kites over the last, well, certainly a year or so. Um, why are we seeing more and more fly surfers? What's the, the, the benefit of them compared with the other brands, would you say, Mirko? I mean, just hearing on what the coach and the athletes say is this, uh, they find a way to be uh, faster, not an easier kite from the beginning. Obvious, their skill is getting better and better from competitor's point of view. Uh, so if they can gain zero point or kind of a knot, then it makes the difference. This is why they start to use uh, more and more of them, the fly surfer, because they get used to, or if it was not the easier one from the beginning. So a hard kite to learn with, um, but once you've got the skills, its top end speed is higher? Yes, exactly. That's what's, ha what's and happened to them. Yeah. What about through the wind range as well? The the ability to to adapt your kite when the wind changes in strength. In in terms of uh, these things, uh, mainly they get prepared and better fit on their legs and their body. We saw some kind of uh, some uh, some of them. They just got some kind of kilos on of muscle. <laughs> to their body, they are really full athletes. They do a lot of exercise on on the fit room, on the gym, and bicycle and uh, uh, rowing and everything is really important for them to push a lot. Just to be clear, Cuban Huang is still leading the race. Um, it, it doesn't read as such top left in the standings, but it's still Huang who has a pretty healthy lead, and he's just gone in to the jibe. Ricardo Pianozzi in second, and it looks like there's a bit of a battle for third and fourth between Paul Labaudet, Labaudet and Ulysse de Riper. So two French fighting for third place between them. Pianozzi looks like he's out of the breeze a little bit, far left of picture. I wonder if the French have got a better gust in the middle of the screen right now. What do you think, Mirko? Yes, I mean, looking from the drone footage, you can definitely see it's more wind on the center of the screen. And the two, uh, Ulysse and, and Paul, they are coming faster and a little bit deeper. But I guess that Pianozzi has enough lead to to keep himself just behind Kibin. And Kibin Huang still leading comfortably on the right of your screen. And Pianozzi not looking too bad for angle now. Looks like he's got good angle. That's the very solid stance of our race leader from China, Kibin Huang. About to go into his final jibe down towards the bottom of the course. Yeah, and again, it's going to score another bullet. The Chinese is in fire since day one. Yeah, he really has come on a lot. He's got so much bigger as well. It just, I, I think I was taller than him last year. I'm 178 centimetres. I, I can't even count how many centimetres. The race winner of Gold 7, Gold Fleet 7 is. That's the tall and the majestic Cuban Huang. Winning another race for China and Riccardo Pianozzi getting another second place for Italy. And increasingly, it looks like those are the two riders that are going to book their spot into the four rider final. It's much more open behind them. And this is the fight between two French riders. It's Ulysse de Riper and Paul Labaudet and absolute neck and neck. But I think it just about goes to de Riper ahead of Baudet. And then in fifth place uh, is uh, Jonathan Joseph from uh, Thailand, Francisco Pero from Spain, and then Jan Koskowski, Dan Bout, Nelda Jam, Wojciechowski, and Piotr Simic are the next ones. And uh, the red kite of Gian Andrea Stragiotti, that's his first disappointing race of the afternoon. And, and also, where was 
Lucas Fonseca from Brazil. So things are gonna mix up in the, uh, the battle further back in the top 10. Back to you shortly. Oristano is the town that we're staying in. It's about five kilometers away from Torre Grande Beach, which you can see there. And that's the Gulf of Oristano where all the action is playing out this afternoon. Uh, Mirko, uh, you um, you come from the north of Italy, is that correct? And yeah, then you moved uh, here. Yeah, from Faenza, from close to Bologna, on the northeast. Now, I was at the 470 Europeans in San Remo last week up in the north, and we weren't hit as badly as other parts of Italy. But I understand you, you had to go up to, to north of Italy to, uh, to help out your parents. They, they were in amongst the flooding, is that right? Yeah, my, my brother, they are really helping a lot. I mean, all Italy is helping that area. Uh, a lot of uh, river just flood up. And a lot of disaster, unfortunately, Faenza and Forlì and Himola, also the, the Formula One, Grand Prix had to be cancelled for that and a lot of disaster. Let's see, something happened in our planet sometime we have to be ready and looking forward to to do something different because these things should not happen on the 2023 and on the future. Well, maybe maybe things partially in our control and maybe things partially, uh, partially beyond our control, but it's hard to imagine today. We've been very lucky with the weather in Torre Grande, or at least we wouldn't normally think we were. We think this is normal and this is standard, but Europe, is, it's been absolutely drenched in rain, not just Italy. I mean, Italy's probably had it worse, but it's been a, a cold and wet start to the year for a lot of us in Europe. Yes, I mean, you're right, but again, uh, we have a lot of uh, people looking on on the difference in terms of climate control, which, as you said, we can't control everything, but it's really important to, to try to do something different, because something different will happen, and just back to a river to avoid flooding, you need to keep it clean, maybe bigger, maybe build some more, and not less. Because we saw over the last few years when it's raining, it's raining more than the past. And uh, everything could happen at once. So you have to try not to get, not prepare to have a proper water, you know, floating to the sea, uh, going to the sea. And if you make a narrow river or you are constructing, making houses or whatever, then doesn't work, doesn't help. This is what happened on the Northeast. So let's see. I really hope, luckily, my parents are held and all the people that we know are well and just wait for new houses. Well, new houses, that's that's quite a thought. So it really, it really was a disaster of some proportions. Now, we're waiting for the course to be reconfigured. There is a, a course change. Um, so, uh, riders' weights, that's, that's quite a, a hot topic in any form of foiling. Uh, we can talk about more about the reasons why in a moment. Let's hear what British rider Lily Young has to say about riders' weights. Particularly hard uh, for girls and women to, to want to have to put on weight for, for competitive reasons. Um, so let's hear her take on it. And the speeds that people are doing, uh, you, the heavier you are, the faster you go. And so I'm wondering aloud to Lily Young here from GBR, um, what kind of pressures that, that creates, particularly for girls and women? 
a lot. And I think definitely the average weight of the fleet has increased a lot in the last year. Um, we've had surveys put out up to do with the next cycle about the maximum kite sizes females should be able to use. And at the end of the day, it's very tricky because um, certain people are going to be benefited from weight caps on the kite sizes um, to the women's fleet. Okay, and what's your personal feeling about that? Because obviously girls and women want to be one side for sort of general day-to-day -day living and feel good about themselves. But if you've got that, if you know that if you're a bit heavy, you're going to be faster on the water, how, how do you play that compromise? I think it's definitely really tricky because it is elite sport we're doing and weight definitely plays a part as it does with lots of other different sports as well. I think having a weight cap, we need to be really careful about what weight that is and how that affects the general fleet and how it affects the individuals in the fleet as well. I think looking forward, there needs to be some deep consideration, I think, into how the next few years are played out with the weight in the women's fleet and the size allowances that there's going to be for the next cycle. Yeah, and so that could be that uh, we don't see 23 square metre kites in future it could be that the limit goes to 21 or something like that is that a possibility yeah the main thing is the bigger kites they're looking at the limits of the the larger sizes as they're typically the ones that are harder to hold on to for smaller riders and what those limits would look like could, could be limited to an 18 meter could be limited to a 23 which is generally the biggest that the men use so people have been voting there's been lots of discussion so in the next few coming i think months we'll, we'll see how that unfolds and and what things come out of the surveys all right, well, thanks for clarifying that, Lily. Weight, as you say, is always an issue in, in elite sport, pretty much whatever we're talking about, and kiting's no different, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways for people to put on weight. It's harder for some than others to put on weight. Um, you obviously want to put on weight in the best way possible, which is usually by lifting in the gym. Um, but it's definitely tricky. It's definitely a difficult subject for lots of coaches to approach with their sailors um, and lots of people to work out, you know, mentally about how they're gonna get better, especially if you're one of the smaller riders and you're struggling to hold on. It's a, definitely a big issue. All right, well, thanks for talking about it, Lily. Cheers. Cool. So that was an interview I recorded a few months ago with Lily Young, who's not here. She's one of the senior competitors, not, not in the youth division. And that was in your neck of the woods in Kettery. Uh, for the World Championships last year, Mirko. And so Lily was speculating, or we were both speculating, about uh, what we're going to do uh, or what the fleet's going to do about limiting the size of the athletes. Um, so I believe there has been decisions made for the 2028 uh, Los Angeles cycle on kite size. Can you update us on that? Yes, the kite size is, uh, they will be limited for the... Uh, for the girl, the 19 is going to be the biggest kite and the 21 the biggest kite for the, for, the, for the boys, for the men. So limiting that for sure, new kite, future kite, they will be high performance anyway. Uh, doesn't matter about the size, but for sure it will help to have a wider range in one side and maybe uh, not need to gain more kilo than than you need uh, so i think it's a really it was really good good choice uh benefit for all the fleet and all the community having this kind of uh, new kite size okay and how well has that been received is, was there much pushback from the bigger riders who want to hang on to 23 square meters for example well i can tell you as far as i i know they all accepted obvious we have a couple of over 100 kilo rider they will uh, they will reduce their weight and they will just eat less <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back to you soon for the start of the next race Okay, so we got one minute 30 to the start of the next race. Someone's got a problem with their kite in the middle of the picture right there. That's that's something you, you hope isn't affecting anyone who's about to start in a minute and 20 seconds. They're gonna be girls 15, right? What do you think? Do you, th do you think they'll be able to recover that kite in time, Mirko? It uh, looks a bit yeah. messy. Yeah, it depends how, how tangled they are. Uh, I know it's just one uh, twisted, so it might it might be okay soon if someone help him to 
to take it off the twist. Oh dear, that must be stressful. Yeah. Now, when you're starting out on kites, you use these uh, leading inflatable edge kites, don't you? Which you, you can't. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I mean, it can happen on something else happen. Obviously, not a twist like that. Otherwise, your leading edge is just gonna be <laughs> explode. But um, yes. You know, at the beginning, lead, uh, dealing with lines and kite, everything can happen, and you really understand how to deal with that. So we have all the girl line up. Fit. Okay, ten seconds to go, and we're just lining up. Fleet just about to get started. Here they go. And we'll see if it's a clear start in a moment. And someone's lost their board on the left-hand side. It was yeah. a clear start. And the, the red kite to the left, that was a bit of a disaster for them. Um, it was Braunova. Dominica, Dominica. Braunova. So not, not one of our front runners. As to the front runners, well, Eloise Pogorie is fast out of the committee boat end of the line again. Nina Archic with the orange ozone kite on the right of your picture, also looking good in the early stages. And Magda Wojciechowska has come out very nicely out of the middle of the start. Yes, and Julia and Eloise Pegori, they are neck to neck uh, on the center of our screen. Right, so that's the two fly surfers just below the uh, the black kite. So the, 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 the two fly surfers in the middle of your screen towards the bottom. And that is Pigorie on the right, holding a marginal advantage over Yulia Damasovic, who's trying to keep her air clear. So advantage Pigorie in the early stages. And Magda Wojciechowska with her kite poked out furthest to the right of the whole fleet, as you see it now. Wojciechowska going into attack on the right-hand side. And also our yellow bib wearer, Pigorie, with her kite on the left of screen now. Yeah, Pigorie just tucked before and Magdalena Wojciechowska just behind. And Yulia Damasovic has carried on a lot further out to the left. And remember, I yeah. the previous race, I doubted uh, Yulia's decision to go that far out to that side. But Damasovic has done it again. And will she find something good on, on the right of your screen? She's one of the three on the right of your screen as we look now. Wojciechowska in the middle and Pogorie on the left. Really strange move for Julia, just all the way to the left. Uh, let's see. She's oh. in good company with the French riders, Lisa Caval and Chloe Reville. So they're all front runners up there in the, the, the top half of the top 10. But uh, tactically, it it makes them quite exposed, doesn't it? You know, uh, what we saw um, all the races during the day, when you approach the top mark, sometimes it's better to come from uh, stay more on on the top and sometimes it's better to tuck earlier and get the gas to closer at, with closer angle and to round the mark let's see now it seems that he, she got really a good move and the wind on the right angle she will run so that's Damasovic in lead. Yep. So that it worked out beautifully for her and remember she was behind Pigorie so Damasovic puts a lot of faith in the left-hand side of this race course and look what a difference it's made. Damasovic in the lead, Wojciechowska in second, Reveal in third and Pogorier in fourth. So this is a three-point gap between Damasovic and Pogorier and well that could be significant on the on the standings. We'll see how that works out later on. I think it would still be enough for Pogorier to lead overall but certainly the gap is going to be closing if things were to stay this way. Of course, a lot of race left here. Damasovic with a very clear lead and what an incredible first beat she did after a fairly below average start. So 
Yeah, Pagoria still with a fairly comfortable overall lead. So Damasovic, she's going to be hard pushed to overtake Pagoria in the overall standings. But what I like about the way the Polish rider has dealt with the last two days, she was top performer yesterday because she crashed in the previous race. I guess she's not going to be um, sort of best point scorer from today because she had a a disastrous um did not finish in the in the previous race but uh when she's staying on the board Damasovic is looking very dangerous indeed and and definitely a contender for the gold medal tomorrow in the medal race series glory reveal jibes out in fourth place onto the far side of the course and again straight behind all all together like we saw before, Doreen Atakan, Nina Arches, Zoe Butang, and Mika Kafri close the top 10 group. Damasovic going into a jibe onto starboard. Magdalena Wojciechowska is clearly second now. Oh, I misread that. I think that was Chloe Reville who I saw. I think this is Damasovic we're looking at now. So Damasovic still leading, going down towards the bottom of the course with a fairly good lead over Poland's Magda Wojciechowska. And then it's looking very close in the next few. There's a bit of traffic for third, fourth and fifth place all about to go around together. So look at the uh, the traffic now it going round in third. It's Chloe Reville. She did that early jive out. Worked for her. Eloise Pegorier in fourth. Um, and Wojciechowska in fourth. In fifth. Fourth or fifth. Lisa Gavallo also in amongst that bunch. Damasovic with a nice clear lead out in front. She had that crash in the previous race, probably, I'm speculating, caused by debris in the water, but so far so good for the Polish rider, looking quite comfortable and sailing an absolute masterful first beat, hitting the left-hand side quite hard, and I don't know how hard she's hit it this side, but she's uh, she's now tacked and presumably will try and one-tack the upwind leg from here. Yeah, she just decided to tuck before and not do like she did before, uh, always to the um, way out of the ley line. She, she, she's playing quiet and stay on the middle of the course. A bit more conservative sailing by Damasovic now that she's in the lead, sailing a, a, a little bit more textbook style rather than throwing all her chips on the left-hand side of the race course. Yeah, she has a really good lead now. We can see the position quite low. The wind is definitely increased because we saw some windsurfer <laughs> also. So at last the windsurfers are going out as well. That's a good sign, isn't it? The wind picking up. Exactly. Now, do you think that the girls, if they wanted to after this race, have time to come in in between races and switch kites? Uh, the wind is not more than I mean they will keep the same size they they would not change right so Demasovic in second there's a sorry in first there's a battle in second between Pogori and Wojciechowska very close between those two and also fighting for second place Chloe Reville and Lisa Caval not too far back so a really interesting battle developing for first place. That space of, sorry, second place, that first, that spacer mark, um, does that apply on all legs of the course, on the second upwind as well as the first upwind? Like the, the spacer mark that you can No, no, there is no spacer mark. They take it away, do they, after the... No, but it's a different mark. Right. Oh, sorry, of course it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep up. <laughs> so Damasovic yeah, appear and disappear that is the <laughs> <laughs>
Oh dear, I've just just been given a penalty in my ear by the by the TV director. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to pay for my for my lack of knowledge. Um, so, uh, but would be nice for the future. Maybe appear the red, disappear the protector. You know, it's a challenge. I, I, I don't know why you haven't thought of that before. Anyway, um, so Damasovic still leading around this other mark, um, this other windward mark, as we're sailing the Bravo two course, and uh, it's still very very close for second, third, fourth, and fifth between the chasing pack, and that chasing pack includes Pigorier, Reveal and Caval from France and Poland's Wojciechowska. So as usual, the, the front places are being dominated by Poland and France. And there are actually other fleets racing out here today, which we're not covering. Uh, there's the boys' silver fleet, the ones that that didn't make it into the gold fleet. They're, they're having a nice race this afternoon. And the Masters, the over 35s, also enjoying a beautiful afternoon of competition for the 35s and over. And uh, not quite as frenetic. They, they're a little bit kinder to each other and the close calls, the, the, the margin calls in the Masters fleet. But these teenagers the, the under the under 21s um well they they push it hard when it requires it and we saw earlier with the tangle between cuban huang and ricardo pianosi sometimes they misjudge it at the moment a beautifully sailed race by Demasovic, and a great way to respond to having had that crash and wiping out when she was in second place in the previous race race 15 is going to go to Yulia Damasovic of Poland, having another sensational day on the water and looking stronger and stronger. And coming across the line is our yellow bib wearer who has come out best out of the fight for second. It's Eloise Pegourier taking second place ahead of the next two French, Lisa Caval in third, Chloe Reville in fifth, and Magda Wojciechowska in fifth. And then a, a bit of a gap back to Nina Arcic, also from Poland in sixth place. We'll take a quick break. Meet the R1V4, our highest performance Olympic and IKA registered racing machine. So Yulia Damasovic seeing it out, seeing out another race win just then ahead of her arch rival Eloise Pegorier, but Pegorier with just one race to go. I haven't looked at the scores yet. We'll do that in a little bit, but I, I think she's probably already already done enough to uh, secure that yellow bib, which is going to be a, uh, a crucial part of what happens tomorrow. Now, we've got a bit of a gap to the next start. So actually, I wonder if this is a good time to look at the medal series for tomorrow. Um, Mirko, uh, this, is, this is quite an innovation, isn't it? Uh, the, the medal series, it, it deals with some of the, the challenges and problems that we have. Uh, how do you rate how the medal series is going? Do you think it's working? Yeah, the medal series that we uh, we put together over the experience uh, on the last year, I think is just really, really good. And it opened the challenge to more athletes on the, uh, the, on the last day, but at the same time, the reward, what the result has been over uh, the all racing day so it's a kind of always a kind of a balance it's nice to see someone that during the last race he win and is the gold medal the gold medalist but on the other hand uh, you have to keep rewarded all the result uh, during the week uh, or the championship i think the way that we run the medal series is really uh, a good good point uh, good format to reward uh, properly the um, 
the way to run semi-final and final giving and playing with match point. Well, I recorded a video uh, recently about this. Let's see what you think of my three-minute description of the medal series format. What is the point of world-class competition? Is it to reward the best athlete with a gold medal or is it to have final day drama with maybe the top 10 all within a chance of being able to win the competition? Well, what if you could have both? That's what the medal series aims to achieve in kite foil racing. So here's how it works. Right, you have qualifying through the week. Someone's wearing the yellow bib. They've, they've won the regatta so far. They go into the final day with the yellow bib. Their reward is that they go into a four rider final that would decide the medals. Okay, so they're straight through. Uh, what about the blue bib wearer, the person who's been second in qualifying? Well, they get a buy through as well. But here's the number to remember, three match points. You need three match points to win in the final. Now, yellow bib, carries through two match points. Only got to win one more race in the four rider final to win the championship. Blue Bib has to win two races because they only carry through one championship point. Then we have third and fourth go through. Well, where do they come from? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten get split out from qualifying into two four rider semi-finals. Third from qualifying goes through as top dog in one side of the draw. Fourth goes through as top qualifier in the other semi-final. And that same three match point scenario that I just explained for the final also applies for the semi-final. So if you're third and fourth from the week, you go through only needing to win one more race. If you're fifth or sixth, you need to win two more races. If you're seventh, eighth, ninth or tenth, from the week, then you've got a lot to do. You've got a mountain to climb. You've got to win three races in the semis just to make it through to the final. Then you'd have to win another three races in the finals. But can it be done? Yes, it can. We've seen it done. We've seen the medal series decided in with just a single race final. And we've seen multiple races as different riders come to the top. But the exciting thing is that whoever crosses the finish line of the final race of the championship will be the winner of the championship. So we think it's as close as you can get to the perfect scenario of final day excitement and also rewarding the most deserving champion with that gold medal. So there we have it. It's a, it's a controversial topic, isn't it? Um, I, I saw a really good medal race at the 470 Europeans last week, and I, I was having an argument with someone saying you, you, you hardly ever get good medal races, and, and then we had one. But it, it, you're sort of at the mercy of how the points have played out with a traditional double points, non-discardable medal race, which we still use in the boat classes. It's not without its merits, but it doesn't really change things very much. As I said on that video, what I love about this format is that whoever wins the last race of the championship will be the gold medalist. It's, it's pretty neat, isn't it? No, this is the entire point. I mean, that was the goal to, uh, from the um, sports side and the TV, the show part, everything mixed together. That's, this is why the format works really well and uh, to reward the competitors and to have uh, the last winner of the last race because it's going to be the third bullet, the third uh, match point and it, it will be the gold medalist and find uh, the right balance to have the first two of the gold going to the final and have the two semi-final of four and reward with two match point and one match point at the third and the fourth two and the fifth and the sixth one I mean, it's a kind of a balance where you you carry over your reward, but you can uh, you can play your benefit if it works well. Otherwise, I mean, you have it, and I mean, and open the door to someone that maybe had the bad luck during the the opening series, and maybe get into the semifinal with the eight position. Well, and and he can he can he can, he can he can get into the final maybe he can win but he have two obvious well, obviously they win a lot of races but well, here's an interesting thing for you Nina Arcic from Poland 
currently lying in sixth place. Now, that if she goes through into the medal series tomorrow in sixth place, that's the exact same position that a year ago here in Toro Grande at the uh, the Youth World Championship, the, the, the world's equivalent of the Europeans are watching now. She had an amazing last day, yeah. and the Polish rider rose up from the semi-finals from sixth place at the beginning of the day, won the gold medal. Absolutely amazing. Meanwhile, let's get back to the final 40 seconds of countdown to the boys' race, and uh, let's see if this time somebody else can take a race win away from China's Kibin Huang who is looking very difficult to beat right now. Mirko, uh, what do you think? Have they seen Yulia Demasevich and how hard she's been hitting the left-hand side? What are they going to do? Let's see if for some of the boys, they will do the same all the way to the left side. I'm pretty curious because now, as we said, the wind is increasing a little bit. We can see white caps out there and really curious. Five seconds to the start. Just about to launch across the start line. Let's see if it will be a clear one. Yeah. Looks competitive. It's a clear start. Clear start. Good news. Let's see who, who was on the left side, on the right side. It's a great start by Gian Andrea Stragiotti with the, the red fly surfer. So he's had a really good one out the middle of the line. Uh, Wojtek Koska, he's one of the best out of the committee boat end of the line. And um, just looking for uh, Lucas Fonseca, he's doing okay. He's not quite in the, the front row, but the Brazilian is is somewhere up there with, with clear air. We have to spot on Kibin and Pianosi as the tracking system seems to be a little bit behind that. If we can so, spot the yellow beep and the blue one. Yes, do do write in if you can see them at the moment we're struggling. Um, so uh, we're just trying to find out where those two front runners are, but uh, Gian Andreas Stragiotti with the, the red kite that's just tacked. You can't really see it from this angle, but he's doing pretty well. I wonder if these two on our right-hand side, I wonder if that's Cuban Huang, the furthest right-hand in, in the screen. I wonder if that is our leader. Because also Wojciechowska, uh, just in front of uh, Andrea Stragiotti, yes, we have two in the front that might be uh, Juan Cuban and uh, Ricardo Pianosi. Yeah. Yeah. So this yeah. is the yellow and the blue bib. It's the usual battle between Cuban Huang and Ricardo Pianosi. Yeah. They are all, they are both on port uh, and tacking now on the ley line. And you, can, going around. Yeah. you can see the, 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 the furthest left-hand boards have really overstood that spacer mark. And Ulysse de Ripa and Paul Labaudet, who are fighting it out at the front of the fleet, those are the two on the left-hand side. But on starboard, it's Cuban Huang, who is now leading in that familiar position, going around the Wimbledon mark in first place. Followed by Wojciechowska and Andrea Strajotti, which we can easily spot because he's the dark kite. So Wojciechowski in second and Stragiotti in third. And where do you think that puts Pianosi? Where is Pianosi? Six, five, six, just straight behind, three behind Stragiotti. So as things stand, well, uh, probably even before this race, actually, I haven't had time to, to do the maths, but I think that Cuban Huang, yes, Cuban Huang will already have the yellow bib secure for tomorrow's medal series and and there's no one that can catch Pianosi for second place so he will be those two will be booking their spot in tomorrow's medal series also to think about is who's going to get that 10th spot at the moment Lucas Fonseca from Brazil well he's sitting in 10th place and uh, Piotr Simiec from uh, Poland and Mattia Maney are just outside the top 10 Mattia Maney is from uh, Great Britain. 
Ki Bin Huang really establishing his dominance on this fleet, leading Wojciechowski in second. Just jabbing it. Amazing the jibe over the foil when they switch the feet. It seems like a dancing step. Huh? It is. It <laughs> is a dancing step, isn't it? And yeah. and uh, we we you know there are some big riders with some uh, very delicate feet. They're they're able to put their feet in just the right place. Another jibe there is actually pretty close between the front two. So Huang is still in the lead. But uh, Wojciechowski, not too far off. And then also Pianosi. Actually, sorry, is it is it Wojtek Koska in second? Yeah. And Ricardo Pianosi in third? Yeah. Pretty close. Good rounding by Koska. Good angle and good rounding by Pianozzi, but a bit of a splashdown for a moment. But actually, good positioning by Pianozzi there, isn't it? Yeah, he tried to keep a um, closer angle to the wind, uh, not to get below Wojciechowska. Now he's pushing a lot to get some, uh, to close the space. So the order is Cuban Huang first, Koska second, Pianozzi third, Yukoski fourth, Stragiotti fifth, and Fonseca sixth. And Huang a little bit lower and faster than the other two. Koska managing to hold the high line of Pianozzi. So Pianozzi rounded really nicely, but Koska managing to hold that second place ahead of Pianozzi. They spread a little bit, huh? They're spreading out, tacking out a little bit earlier than the leaders, trying something different. Is, th is that what you're seeing, Mirko? Yes, exactly. Pianozzi went all the way up eating the ley line on the left part, left side of the course. Uh, Doing a bit of a Demasevich, I might say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it looks pretty good up there, actually. I, I wonder if Pianozzi has made a small game by just going a little bit harder up to that left-hand ley line. Yeah, difficult to judge from here because one Kibin was quite in front. Yeah, he's way up compared to Ricardo. Yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe things not changing that much. There's, that is the battle for second between Koska and Pianozzi. That's probably the most interesting. Huang still with a very significant lead over the rest of the fleet. So one of the benefits to the rest of the top 10 is that uh, i mean if we were talking about a normal series even with a medal race huang would have bagged the gold medal with the day to spare wouldn't he there would be no coming back on the utterly consistent performance of huang but huang is going to have to sail a good day tomorrow to see out the championship so from the other point of view that obviously gives hope to the likes of pianozzi koska um, the, the rest of the, the top 10. Um, what's going to be the mindset that they need to carry into that? Do they, do, do they still believe that they can beat Cuban Huang tomorrow? Uh, difficult, difficult to judge that because, you know, after four days or the day of racing and then you are always behind, difficult to dream that <laughs> the last day you can be in front of it but for sure the dream is always the last things that you have to put in your pocket you have to keep dreaming the good thing is there is a kind of percentage that it can happen for sure not easier but it, it might happen and for whatever reason 
What do you think Pianozzi is thinking? What What's he seeing of Huang that Pianozzi can't, can't quite do? Uh, I think I think that Ricardo, uh, after the crash, where it was the only part of the day that it was in front of Kibin, and he could manage, and uh, he just sit down and say, okay, let's manage to get with two with one bullet on into the final without using energy to do to run the semi-final and uh, try to beat him directly on the final i think that's the mindset of ricardo it's looking more and more like this is going to be another race win for Kibin huang it's it's academic uh, because one way or another huang has been utterly dominant the last number of days he will continue to wear the yellow bib going into tomorrow's medal series um and then it's going to be Pianozzi, who is uh, carrying second, the, the blue bib, into um, the race tomorrow. And Wojtek Koska, uh, well, he's lying. he was lying third going into the day. I'm not sure where he's going to be after this race, but that will have done him no harm at all. So Koska also done very well. Yeah, and third, Wojtek Koska. And Lucas Fonseca, well, he was in 10th place. That was a critical fourth place for the Brazilians across the line because that should be enough to ensure that Fonseca stays in the top 10 and lives to fight another day in the medal series, which just to say again, if you sail well enough, if you can climb that mountain, you can even win the gold medal from eighth, ninth or 10th place uh, if that's where you finished up today. So really interesting scenario shaping up for tomorrow, but uh, who's going to have the medal? to be able to overtake Cuban Huang. Really close finish there, just outside the top 10. The battles continue, uh, but we will take a quick break. Right, so we've got one more race to run this afternoon. That's the final race for the girls. We've got five minutes until the start of that race. Um, let's just take a look at the scores on the board for the girls and see how things are playing out. Who's likely to be going through to the 10 rider medal series tomorrow? So Eloise Pagorier, well, still pretty comfortably in the lead. She's going to carry the yellow bib through to tomorrow. Uh, Yulia Damasovic, well, she's going to hang on to that blue bib um it's still close-ish for the next for the next ones it's still important to try and hold on to third or fourth place or do better if you can so uh, potentially lisa Kaval and magdalena wojciechowska are going to go through as the front runners on their sides of semi-final a and semi-final b tomorrow but chloe reveal is not far behind nina archich in six i mentioned last year that when we were here a year ago in toro granite she managed to rise from six um going into the final day and win the, the gold medal from there and here are the rest of our top 10 catalina turienzo from argentina turkey's darren atacan zoe puteng from france and israel's mika caffrey just inside the top 10 um and so we need to keep an eye on how the Israeli rider does in this one. Will uh, Mika Kafra be able to hold on to 10th place? We've got just over three and a half minutes to go before the start of the race. So, had an interesting day today. Um, any any high points, any low points for you? Any points of excitement you want to go back to? I mean, continue to look into the girl. Um, you pointed out... Um, 
Nina archives in same place as last year. What we can expect tomorrow? I don't know. Let's see. It might be some surprise, but for sure, Julia and uh, Eloise, they had really massive day and always leading and battle between them. It's going to be really interesting to see the final, the semi-final first and the final, and who from the semi-final will get the other two spots for yeah. the final. And what, what, what's the rest of the world got to do to catch up with these Polish and French teams, do you think? Now I think that the Polish, uh, the Polish team and the French team, they did such an amazing work and uh, they run a navy program uh, in crossover between the youth and the let's say the senior and uh, now they have a really big squad and uh, and also from let's say call it first row second row third row of level they are really higher and it's going to be difficult for the rest of the world to catch up looking for uh, LA 2028 they can't miss, I mean, the rest of the world, they can't miss any more months. They have to start now to to deal with their new athletes for LA 2028, I must say. There is no way to catch up for Paris next year. Right, right. And the, the interesting thing is that the riders that at the senior level are also very young. And uh, the likes of Cuban Huang, Ricardo Pianozzi, uh, Yulia Damasovic, uh, they have a serious chance of being able to represent their countries at the Olympics next year and to be in medal contention. I don't mention Eloise Pigorier there because I think she's got a lot to do to overcome the senior French riders who are very strong. Lorianne Nolot, Poema Newland, Jesse Camp, and there are just so many good senior French in front of her. But in the, in the case of Wang Poland. Pianozzi, um, they they look like they're pretty much well. Wang certainly the best of of his country. It's a, it's a not so cut and dried for for Pianozzi or for Damasovic from Poland. But we we could see these these young riders actually standing on the Olympic podium next year. Yeah, for sure. Some of the country like the Poland uh, you mentioned, they are the best on their country. So they definitely represent their. One of them, the youngest, they will represent their country on the Olympic. But on the great, on the big picture, they need really to start all the rest of the world. They need to start to do quite an art program to catch up the French. 25 seconds to the start. Let's see how things are going to shape up this time. Who's going to go for what side of the course is... Julia Damasovic going to continue to fight for the left-hand corner of the race course that's worked so well for her today. Three seconds, two, one, off they go. All clear start. So very, very good set of uh, clear starts today. We've only had that one rider over the line in one of the men's uh, starts so good clean competition today out of the start line and so the battle begins who can see out the day in the best way possible Eloise Pogorier and Julia Damasovic they already booked their place in the four rider final tomorrow but that doesn't mean they're not going to be pushing hard they, they still this is a battle of confidence not just of of pure race results and as to the rest well what can they achieve because the points are a little bit closer the likes of Lisa Caval, uh, Chloe Reville from France, Magdalena Wojciechowska, Nina Arcic that battle between the French and the Polish continues so good you start can see now the, do you see the wind uh, is clear all over the race all right you can see Less, less guest. The Yes, the, the breeze has really picked up and it's solidified across the Gulf of Oristano. So there's less holes in the, in the race course. Maybe it doesn't matter quite so much which corner you choose. Um, so it might be a more even race course, but let's, let's see how things play out. We've got a, um, an ozone on the far right hand 
side of our picture who's really hit that side hard. But Eloise Pigore and Julia Damasevich reveal Chloe. Already looking good. So Pigorier looking very commanding out front. Yulia Damasevich just tucked away behind her, but still very much in the fight. And Magda Wojciechowska also up in the top three right now. Pretty good consistency for Eloise Pigorier on the starting line and first up wind. She's been always on the top. Yeah, and it's such a big part of the of the race here. Just so seeing uh, one of the masters from Denmark, Hendrik, walk past two big thumbs up. Looks like the masters have had an absolutely fantastic rip roaring day out there on the race course. Uh, they're they're here more for the fun than for the points. Most of them anyway. It's still it's still big battles going on out the front of the, the Masters fleet. But here is the battle in the final race. Oh, there's a there's been kite down in the water quite near the top mark. That's got to be one of the front runners that's suffering there. But out ahead of the pack, it's... Uh, is it Damasovic who's out in the lead or is it Pegorier? I thought it was Pegorier, but it couldn't... But now I see Pegorier uh, stop it on the... Is it? It's not Pegorier that had the crash, is it? No, we just stop. Maybe it's Pegorier that had the crash. So we we need to clarify on that when we can. But we think it's Julia Damasovic who's now got a fairly significant lead over Lisa Caval in second and Magdalena Wojciechowska with Catalina Turienzo from Argentina in fourth. And Nina Archis then. And Nina Archic always around fifth or sixth. <laughs> so Pegoria, is she is she up there? Or we, it's difficult to say. Pegoria could still be one of the front runners. We'll try and confirm that as soon as we can. Yeah, because the only two, yeah, because the only two that I can see here is Eloise Pegoria and Reveal Chloe, which they are. So we see only one kite. So it must be one of the two. And Elo is still on the front. Right. We will know. We will know soon. So beautiful speeds downwind. Absolutely flying. I think she's second. Julia Damasovic didn't have the best start. Pretty good start, but she somehow found, finds her way through to the front at the top quarter of these windward legs. She's really good at playing the top of the course. Now driving on to port, followed, we think, by Pigorier. So we think it's Damasovic, Pigorier. And Lisa Caval and Magda. So it's the usual battle between Poland and France. Damasovic into the jibe, safely executed, and now Pegorier follows her through, followed by Kaval and Wojciechowska. For the second upwind. So I wonder if Pagorier thinks that she's got a, a bit of a speed advantage upwind compared with Julia Demasevich. Thing is, I, I don't think the course is long enough for her to be able to really no. make that advantage work anyway. No, absolutely not. She's controlling and... The waves are picking up a little bit. Yeah, now it's clearly good wind all over. And it's just getting better and better this afternoon. I think it's time for you to go wing foiling later on, isn't it, Mirko? Well, let's see if we have time. 
I mean, this condition is beautiful for kite foiling as well. Oh, there's a, not a great tack there on the left-hand side of screen. Quite a lot of distance given away there. But Julia Damasovic still leading with Eloise Pegorier in second. But Damasovic, if anything, looks like she's stretching her lead. So whilst Pegorier is quite clearly the yellow bib leader, she's had the, the best series. I, unlike what we were saying about Wang's dominance. Um, oh, hang on, that's Pegorier swimming. That's the yellow. That's the yellow. So that's the that's the one that we saw stop it on fracking. Yeah, red helmet. So that's not the best way for Pegorier to finish her afternoon. It's not going to take the yellow bib away from her, but uh, that's going to be a bit of a confidence knock for Pegorier and. Julia Damasovic, apart from that crash earlier where she crashed out of second place and didn't manage to finish the race, she's had a very solid day and she had a very solid day yesterday, winning three out of the four races. And in terms of momentum of confidence, I think the confidence is really building with Damasovic. Yeah, unless the only race that she missed when she fell down. But she keeps the confidence because then... She's gonna she's gonna have uh, another bullet today. Yeah. So Mako, who's in the who's in and around the top ten, just so we know um who to watch out for if we so we had people. Eloise and Julia first and second, then Lisa Caval, Magdalena Wojciechowska, Chloe Reville, Nina Arches. Catalina Turienzo, Dorina Takan, Zoe Butan, and close the top 10, uh, the young Israeli and Mika Kafri. And then just behind her is D Darian Deniz from Turkey. By two points. By two so. points. So yeah. that's, a, that's a critical one. And Gal Boca in 12th, uh, Israeli rider. Then there's 20 point gap. Then right. It's going to so be it's, difficult. It's, it's between Mika Kafri and Darian Deniz. Okay, Damasovic leading down the final run. Wojciechowska in second and a really good race for Argentina's Catalina Turienzo in third, just ahead of Lisa Cavallan. Look at that gust top left of your screen. Really strong breeze coming down with the second, third and fourth riders. Damasovic stretching away, showing her absolute class in these perfect conditions in the Gulf of Oristano. Wojciechowska in second, top left. Turienzo, could she hang on to third place? She was in and around seventh going into this race, so that there should be plenty to see the Argentinian rider into the medal series tomorrow. And what a great confidence builder for her. Damasovic completes her last jibe of the afternoon, swings her kite down into the power zone, and it's the final high speed reach, 35 knots into the finish. And perfect wait for Julia Damasovic to see out the afternoon. She's had an absolutely fantastic set of races. And it's going to be Magda Wojciechowska bringing it home for Poland. So it's a it's a one-two for Poland. And who is going to be able to get across the line between the next two? It looks like Lisa Caval might have just got ahead of Turienzo from Argentina, but it was very close in the finish there. And, and well, is Nina. that Nina Arcic? Yeah, with those on. <laughs> so 
pretty much, uh, well, fifth place in that race, I think, fifth or sixth. Duren Atakan, well, that was a name. Duren Atakan and Mika Kafri, the next two across the line. Well, those are the two who are absolutely on the cusp of uh, making it into the um, medal series tomorrow. So that's too close to call. Um, sorry, it was Duren Deniz, actually. The wrong, uh, the wrong mm. Derin I was talking about there. It's Duren Deniz. So maybe that has been enough just to lift Mika Kafri from Israel into the final and 10th spot for tomorrow's medal series so there we have it that's uh that's the race is done and dusted for this, this afternoon, afternoon and we've we've only got the medal series to go tomorrow uh mirko any standout performances you want to mention obviously the the the, the obvious ones are uh huang in the uh, in the men Pigorie, the yellow bib wearer but um crashed in that last race and wasn't able to finish the last race goes to show um, even the best can come a cropper. They can they can struggle in the wrong circumstances. Well, you, you know, you know, Andy, uh, that easy uh, to make a mistake and uh, can happen. Everything can happen. They are leading. They are going faster. They are challenging themselves. It's just a second, and there is a mistake. But again, a lot of good consistency from them, and we will see them on the final tomorrow. Okay, I don't know if we can get any scores up on the board. Uh, let's see if we can get some points on the board just to see which men are in for the final. Okay, so uh, Cuban Huang, um, Ricardo Pianosi go through to the medal series and then the third down to 10th will split out into two semi-finals and Koska and Stragiotti will carry two match points into their side of the draw so they're in the box seat for getting into the four rider final and then it will be up to the rest Labodeir, Jurkowski, De Jahan, Fonseca, De Ripa and Wojciechowski to see if they can upset the apple cart so that's the situation with the men. It's probably a little bit too soon to put up the girls' scores, but the, the interesting one there will be to see if Mika Kafri, the Israeli rider, has done enough to uh, to displace Derin Deniz from Turkey in the final 10th spot. We'll go to a quick ad. That's the situation on Torre Grande Beach. The riders coming ashore. It's been a long, exhausting, but also very rewarding day of racing on the Gulf of Oristano. Mirko, I can't wait to get going tomorrow for the medal series. It, there's, there's always a lot of uncertainty coming into that. That's what I love about it. Uh, Kevin Huang, we just saw him walk past our commentary booth looking very happy, as he should do. So an absolutely brilliant day. Eloise Bugorier, the yellow bib wearer in the women. She's going to come ashore with a wet kite that she's going to need to dry out this evening, but that will sort itself out. Um, your thoughts about tomorrow? I mean, um, tomorrow everything can happen. This is why I love this format so much. And uh, for sure it's going to be a good debrief debrief debriefing for all the ones that have to run uh, on the medal series over the semi-final. Um, and uh, he have to, you know, it's going to be the last day, semi-final, they have to push 
as much as they can because if you have a um, if you have a uh, a score uh, one or two uh, carryover score then bullets then you have to go and and close the deal before you get nervous if someone uh, win your semi-final so it's gonna be also a mental game for them on the into the semi-final and for the one on the final then waiting for who is gonna join them on the final so again it's gonna be really tactical mental physical uh, part of the the race uh, before to get the, the gold medal into the neck, their neck. I guess that is going to be really important for tomorrow.